if you do this the way that I'm saying it, you will look good faster and better than you, you would if you did it the wrong way. Because I think sometimes people feel like there's a trade. So somebody watching right now might be like, yeah, that sounds really good. You know what he's saying, but I just want to, I just want to get this weight off right now. Like I'm so I got eager. my wedding coming up. I got this, yeah. I got this situation. No, no, no. The wrong way is the wrong way in every, <laughs> every facet. You're not going to get there faster by doing it the wrong way. You're not going to, you're going to get there faster and better doing it the way that I'm describing. Okay. There is a right dose when it comes to, um, exercise and the right dose gets you there the fastest. More gets you there slower. Now we're compromising ability to adapt and recover. Too little, obviously, I'm not uh, sending the signal, uh, a signal that's strong enough to get my body to adapt the way that I want it to. There is a right dose and more or less gets me there slower. So I wanna say that because it's a very important selling point to what I'm saying. It's also extremely true. You'll get there faster, I promise you. And it do, and it'll feel easier. And this is where people get caught up. They think, oh, I can do more. If I do more, then I'll get there faster. No, no, no. There's the right dose, and then there's what you could tolerate, and then beyond. What you can tolerate is not what gets your body to adapt the fastest. What gets you your body to adapt the fastest is the the right dose. All right, let's talk about uh, longevity for a second. Muscle is extremely protective. This is, this is, uh, we're now, we're just now starting to figure this out, by the way, all the studies, maybe up until the last, I'd say decade, most of the studies done on exercise and health revolved around one form of exercise, cardiovascular activity. I mean, you pick any study from, you know, 10 years ago and beyond and all, all the forms of exercise, every study used cardiovascular activity. Why? I think it was the easiest to apply it was the one everybody understood. Um, it's easy with animals, put them on a hamster wheel. It's kind of hard to get a hamster to lift weights uh, or do yoga. So that's that's what we saw. So very little studies were done on strength training and muscle and it's a protective effects, except for maybe with athletes and performance, there really wasn't uh, anything that was out there. Well, now we have data that supports what those of us uh, who've worked with uh, everyday people for a while have have seen which is that muscle is extremely um, important for longevity. In fact, so muscle, we can use, we could talk about strength because strength is a, a great proxy for muscle, okay? Uh, there's one test that we're now, we're, we're now really starting to figure this out. And there's several studies on this. There's one metric that a doctor could use that will predict all cause mortality better than almost any other single metric, okay? Now, to be clear, if you want to predict all-cause mortality, you want to use multiple metrics. That's how you're going to get the most accurate reading. But if you had to pick one, there's actually one that's better than all the others. It's a grip strength test. A simple grip strength test will tell you more about somebody's all-cause mortality than almost anything else. Why? Because, uh, well, first, grip strength is a proxy for overall body strength, and body strength is a proxy for muscle. Well, what is that telling us? Well, a couple different things. One, uh, mobility. Uh, anybody who's ever taken care of uh, an elderly family member will tell you this, uh, but loss of mobility is a significant contributor, contributor to uh, mortality, okay? There's a saying in uh, medicine, you break your hip and you die of pneumonia. Uh, your, your bone strength, your ability to take care for yourself and move, this is all very, very important when it comes to longevity. And uh, the, the less you can care for yourself and the less you move, the faster your health uh, begins to decline. Well, muscle is, is how we move. So strength and mobility, you need those to be able to do those things. There's also the hormone uh, effects of muscle. We talked about insulin sensitivity uh, off air. You mentioned, um, I think you mentioned Alzheimer's or dementia as type three diabetes. Um, this, uh, this was speculated for a while. We're just now starting to see that this is probably what's going on, that it's the brain uh, becoming, maybe losing its ability to use glucose the way that it, it could before. And we start to see these uh, these detriments in our cognitive function, and that starts to decline very quickly after a certain period of time. Nothing improves insulin sensitivity like building muscle. Nothing. In fact, there was a study done out of uh, Australia, Sydney, Australia, where they used strength training 
and they saw the, the, the halting of the progression of beta amyloid plaque in Alzheimer's patients. And it was actually the first time a non-medical intervention showed that. In fact, wow. uh, it started to trend towards it reversing, which mm. was kind of uh, interesting. Um, so insulin sensitivity, that's a big one. Uh, let's talk about metabolism again. Here's why the amount of calories your body burns on its own is so important. When we look at diet, we can look at components of nutrition and say, these things are healthy, these things aren't so healthy, and these things are not very healthy at all. Uh, sugar, for example. Sugar's got some utility, but there's lots of studies that will point to the overconsumption of sugar and show how it can you know, contribute to you know worse health outcomes, obesity, uh, reduced longevity, all that stuff. Certain fats, uh, there, you know, there's some controversy around saturated fat, but even the studies on saturated fat will show overconsumption can cause all these different things. I'll use those two because those are the two, two most uh, popular ones. When a diet is low in calories, or let me rephrase that, when you're eating a diet that it doesn't, um, doesn't have as more calories than you can burn, okay? So if you can burn more calories than you consume, or at least burn the calories you do consume, the negative effects that we see from things like sugar, saturated fats, and other components of food are greatly reduced, dramatically reduced. Now, it's not perfect, but there are studies, and, and I hate it when scientists do this. because so, so just to make sure I understand that, sorry to interrupt you because I know you're on a roll. So being in a slight calorie deficit, mm -hmm. you're saying that even the same composition of some of the macros of saturated fat, you know, fats, sugars, other things, they don't have as much damage than being in a surplus where somebody's eating more calories. Some would even argue, and I wouldn't go this far, but some would even argue that the, the damage is almost gone. So scientists love to do this. I love to prove uh, people in the health and wellness space wrong. Uh, now, I'm going to tell you why I think this is they're, what they're saying is also wrong, but the data that they're showing does uh, illustrate something really important. So they'll take, um, they'll do this where they'll say, okay, we put this person on a fast food diet. McDonald's, and they were only eating 1,500 calories a day. And look at all their blood markers. Better, you know, lipid profile, and their inflammatory markers went down, and their health improved, and they lost weight. And that's their way of showing those of us in the health and wellness space that you're wrong. It's all about calories, okay? So they're right and they're wrong. One, they're right in that a calorie deficit really does make up a lot of uh, uh, in terms of the, the damage. Makes a huge just because you're not overloading your body with all those glucose spikes that might be coming with calories. You're not, you're not in a place where your system is always kind of having to work. You're burning it off. You're using it for energy. And that process is healthy. The burning of energy and all that stuff is healthy. But here's why they're wrong. What you eat also determines how you feel and it also influences your behaviors. So whenever somebody presents a study like that to me, and they say it's all about calories and maybe macros and what makes up those macros like proteins, fats, and carbs and calories doesn't matter as long as you hit the right numbers. Um, I would like to see how uh, how sustainable it would be to eat a 1,500 calorie McDonald's diet. Yeah, okay? for like a year, Never. two years, no way. three years, four no years. No way. <laughs> those, those foods influence your behaviors. They make you want to overeat. They make you feel a particular way and how you feel determines whether or not you're going to eat one way or another. Not just to mention that, but the environmental setting, you're going to McDonald's, you're picking something up. You feel like, Oh, you know what? I've been good for like two weeks. <laughs> I need to treat myself today. You know, the, the Sunday machine is working all of a sudden. Yeah. Let's, let's get some of that. So there's so many factors that there, there is, but it's, um, but I mean, the point I'm making here is if you can get your metabolism to ramp up, it means that you can eat more overall and get away with more overall in the long term. Okay. That's a good thing. Why? Look around. We're, I could right now on my phone while we're doing the show, I could on my phone in 10 minutes have pretty much any flavor of any food that I want delivered here right this second for very inexpensive. We live in an environment where we are uh, bombarded and surrounded by food uh, and snacks and candy and treats and whatever, a faster metabolism is an asset. Now, 
if this was 50,000 years ago, this would be a very different conversation. 50,000 years ago, our conversation would be, how can we make our metabolism slower? How can we become more efficient? Because I need to survive on the fact that, man, it is hard to find food. Today, it's like, there's so much food and I could try to be a monk with my diet. This is, you know, it's one of the problems that I have with my space in particular. So we're talking about the fitness side of the health and wellness space is it's often communicated by these fanatics, by these like, like, uh, these fitness monks or gurus, or, um, I like to say that they're dysfunctional. A lot of them are orthorexics and they communicate what works for them to the average person. So they'll say things like it's discipline, food is food is fuel and just do it. It's like the average person's like, what? Like, I don't live to exercise. I exercise to live. That doesn't make any sense to me. I can't, I can't do that. That doesn't, that doesn't work. And to the fitness fanatic uh, or someone who's got a dysfunctional relationship with those things, they're like, just do it anyway type of deal. So no, we want to put ourselves in a position to where we live our lives and um, you know, Sundays I go out with my friends and we have a pizza and some beer and I go on vacation sometimes and sometimes we have ice cream and it doesn't cause all these problems because I've got a metabolism that's roaring and that kind of negates a lot of these, uh, a lot of these foods. And it gives me some flexibility. That's a massive asset. It makes things much more sustainable. It protects me. Muscle protects me against the ills of modern life. Here's another thing that muscle does. We're sedentary. All of us are. You know, if you work out for an hour, seven days a week, you're sedentary. People don't realize this. If you have a normal, typical job nowadays, which is at a desk in front of a computer, and you work out one hour every single day, you are still sedentary. And and you don't have anything else is what you're saying. Yeah. No, I mean- and, Besides and, you're just normal, sort of just walking around the house yeah, or whatever. Exactly. You, you, you work out in the morning for an hour, then you go to work, you, you, you sit down at your desk for eight hours, 10 hours, then you drive in your car, you go home sit down, eat dinner. Maybe you, you walk in your Is house Is that a based bit. on a, like a specific definition? I've heard sometimes the definition, you know, that, you know, CDC just put out there is like anything less than like 6,000 steps is sedentary. Or are you just saying evolutionary comparing to like our ancestors mm -hmm. were sedentary? Compared to how our bodies evolved to move, we're very sedentary. By the yeah. way, 6,000 steps is, <laughs> you know, CDC puts out, um, interesting guidelines uh, sometimes. By, by the way, what is common is not normal. Um, you can look at what the average person does and be like, oh, that's that's normal. That's what we should do. No, no, that's just common, right? Right, right. Yeah, modern life- It's uh, common to be overweight today, so yeah. you can't say that that's actually yeah. normal for our biology. Yeah, we're, we're sedentary, okay? How do I protect my body um, in this modern lifestyle where I'm not moving that much? Well, muscle. Muscle does this for you. Uh, I'm not moving much, but I got this muscle on my body that can move when I want it to, that burns calories, that uh, maintains my testosterone levels and makes me sensitive to insulin and growth hormone, helps regulate my cortisol, um, help, helps regulate my mood. There's chemicals in, in muscle when you flex and extend and, and stretch and, and just get up and move in muscle that are released that have antidepressant effects, anti-inflammatory effects uh, on the body. Um, it's like it's like an investment, okay? Um, trying to burn calories by moving all day long, which, okay, you can do that if you want. I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's a sustainable approach for most people, we're busy, but that's fine. But that's like trying to earn money every hour. So I have an hourly wage, I'm just gonna, the way I'm gonna get wealthy is I'm gonna work more and more hours. I mean, that's one way to do it, but there's only so many hours a day what if you took that money, put it somewhere and it made money for you? This is what muscle essentially does for you. You know, another great thing about muscle, which is kind of cool. Uh, I used to hate this as a trainer. I would get a client that would say something like, um, okay, once I get in shape, then what happens if I stop working out? And I was like, well, then you get out of shape. I guess your body just kind of reverts back, right? There's no, per there's no permanence with this, but there is something interesting about muscle that it's not permanent, but it's pretty cool, pretty close. There's something called muscle memory, and this has been well documented in studies. If you were to gain, let's say, let's say you gain seven pounds of muscle right now, okay, which is very realistic for a male to do, let's say, over the course of maybe six months. You gain seven pounds of lean body mass, and it takes you six months of, of good, consistent exercise. You're, you're feeding your body adequate protein. You gain seven pounds of muscle. And then let's say for whatever reason you lose it, you stop working out, become very sedentary and it's gone. You lose it in a month, seven pounds of lean body mass is gone. 
If you go back to start working out again, you'll gain back that seven pound, seven pounds of lean body mass in like two months, hmm. maybe a month. If you've ever had a cast on a broken limb, you've experienced this. I don't know if you've ever done that, but yeah. you know, yeah, where you, you take the cast off and it's like all the muscles gone and it looks weird. And then very quickly the muscle comes back. There's something called muscle memory. And this has to do with satellite cells and how your body prepares and preps itself to regain muscle that was once lost. So if you build some muscle, gaining it back happens very quickly. We also don't lose muscle very quickly. So if you did strength training very consistently, let's say three days a week, and it was what you did, and then you stopped strength training for a couple weeks, you wouldn't lose any muscle within a couple weeks. It would all stay on your body. You stopped exercising for two whole weeks. You probably wouldn't lose any in a whole month as long as your nutrition was okay and you were relatively active. You wouldn't lose much at all. In fact, they did a study... I love this study uh, where they compared two groups of men. One group worked out, strength trained every week, every single week consistently. The other group did three weeks on, one week off. So every month they took a whole week off. At the end of the, I believe it was a 24-week study, the strength and muscle gains were identical. Mm. Identical. They literally worked out one-fourth less than the other group, took a whole week off every month and built the same strength and muscle. Um, there's other studies that show that however much you train to build a certain amount of strength and muscle, about one, some studies show maybe one fifth, I've seen a study that shows one ninth of the training volume is required to keep it. Mm. So you work out, let's say three days a week to get to a certain level of strength and muscle, then you're happy, go once a week. It's not going to go anywhere. You're going to keep it. Right now that there's more to that, of course, there's health benefits with just moving and going and all that stuff. So you're, you're probably not gonna have the same health benefits, but from a muscle standpoint, metabolism standpoint, you know, all the stuff that I'm talking about, uh, you're, you, you're kind of going to keep it by doing a lot less. Now, could I possibly paint a more perfect form of exercise in the context of modern life with the average person? Think about their struggles and what they're dealing with and how challenging it is to be consistent. And there's food everywhere. And I'm not like a fanatic. I don't want to work out every single day. And, you know, like hormone imbalances, like, uh, boy, hormone imbalances are, are more common than not nowadays. Like when you think of all those things, is there a form of exercise that is more suitable? There isn't. So, you know, this is what I'm going around preaching right now and trying to explain to people. It's like, look, if you're going to choose a form of exercise and you're, you, you want to do this in a way that's fast and sustainable, Here's the, the most effective approach. Everything else has got benefit. I don't, I don't want to be, um, you know, I don't want, I don't want to be misunderstood. All activity applied appropriately is good for you. Okay. But one of them definitely shines above the others in the context of, you know, what the average person experiences. I think it's so helpful for you to say it so clearly because there is, as more people are realizing the power of being active and not living this hyper sedentary life that we have. And they have this menu of options that are there. And there's people that are out there that are saying, hey, you know, shoot for those 10,000 steps. And walking is like, at least start there. And, and again, there's going to be an argument yeah. for all of these different things. And you're agreeing to that. And as you start to zoom out and you are a normal human being that's trying to eat well, but maybe still have, you know, some flexibility for mm -hmm. your family, especially if you have kids, you are trying to make sure that you can grow in your career. You're trying to make sure you have some elements of stress management and community and maintain friendships and maintain a social life that's there. And you might have hobbies, uh, community service. You know, these are all the different things that are there in your life. So when it comes to this exercise component and the movement component, it feels increasingly like people have a lot of different options, right? There's like steps, there's, okay, let's do this cardio, yeah. let's do that. And what I'm hearing from you is like, look, all those things can have benefits, mm -hmm. But if you're looking for the one, especially if you're wellness oriented, which is our audience here, that pays the most dividends, yes. we're going to first make sure before everything else, we have an appropriate plan for strength training, you know, as long as you are in a place where you can, you know, do that and you're not like physically hurt and you don't, you're not like, that's the rare exception. We're going to first prioritize strength training. And then if you have extra room, and you love to get extra steps in, amazing. And you can combine that with walking with a friend and you get your social thing in, good. But do not 
under prioritize the strength training piece. Yeah, that should be the, that, and yes. And let me actually touch on a few things uh, that you said there. Um, one of the things I figured out as a trainer, as a coach was, you know, okay, all these things work and here's the things that we need to focus on. And, you know, here's what's most effective. But then what really be, helped me become successful and any coach or trainer right now that's been doing this for over 10 years, who's, who's found a high success rate will understand completely what I'm about to say is how do I do this and communicate this in a way to where the person can make these fundamental changes and maintain them and want to maintain them. Okay. Want to continue doing this, that it's not this like white knuckling the whole time. You mentioned steps. Okay. I love walking. Here's why I love walking. Number one, everybody could do it. A uh, very low skill form of activity. Other uh, forms of activity re uh, require a level of skill. People tend to you know, injure themselves running, right? Running, let's go run. Well, most people don't know how to run. They haven't run since they were 10. Uh, they put on their running shoes, they go run, and they end up hurting themselves. But most people can walk. And I love walking also because it's easy to inject into your everyday life. So when I would train clients, I would definitely do the strength training part. And that's where I would do a lot of the coaching. But then on the days they didn't see me, I would communicate activity uh, like this. Um, I don't want you to, to take 30 minutes out of your day and hop on a treadmill. Okay, that's way less sustainable than what I'm about to say. What I want you to do is uh, after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, go for a 10 minute walk. Or for every hour you're at your desk, get up and walk for five minutes. And maybe that looks like you go to the bathroom on the second floor. So you just walk up the stairs, go to the bathroom, come back down, go back to your desk. When you add that up, what you find is about 45 minutes or 30 minutes of walking every single day. Now, why do I communicate it this way? Because it's in, it's already kind of, uh, it's, it's easy to inject into your life and it's combined with things that you already do. You know, getting on your workout clothes, going to the treadmill or going to the gym, timing yourself for 30 minutes, I got to schedule the time out, whatever. Much harder to maintain than after you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, just walk for 10 minutes or every hour, go do a five to 10 minute walk in the office. Like way easier to maintain. And people would become uh, far more consistent with that. I found similar approaches with diet, um, with strength training. One other thing you said about strength training um, that I want to touch on is, you know, as, so long as you're not injured and it's appropriate for you, strength training has a lot of uh, unique attributes. And I say unique because other forms of exercise don't necessarily share these attributes. And one of them is that strength training can be appropriate for anyone, anyone. Now, someone might be thinking like, what are you talking about? What do you mean anybody? The number one tool in physical therapy that a physical therapist use for rehab, people who've been injured, car accidents, severe trauma, is strength training. Yeah. What is strength training? Well, yeah, it's, it's you know, picking a barbell off the ground is strength training, but so is uh, using a resistance band or my body weight or creating tension against the wall Let's say I push my arm up against the wall. That would be an isometric form of strength training. Uh, strength training is moldable like no other form of exercise. I could use any amount of weight or no weight and create resistance that can provide the benefits that I'm talking about. All strength training is, is exercising in a way to promote strength, okay, to build strength. Well, when I had, you know, an 85-year-old client who would come hire me. And at one point I had quite a few uh, people um, that were in advanced age to come hire me. And I'd have them sit down on a bench and I'd have them try to reach up above their head. And that would be very challenging for them just to straighten their arm up above their head. Well, that was our exercise. Hmm. And I'd sit behind them and I'd say, straighten your arm out as hard as you can. We're going to hold that for 10 seconds. That's strength training. Strength training would be for some people going up against the wall, moving your feet away from it and doing some push-ups against the wall. It'll be using a resistance band. All you're trying to do is use appropriate resistance. How do you pick appropriate? What do you do now? What's a little more than what you do now? That's appropriate. Okay. So if you do nothing, it doesn't take much. You've been working out for years. It's going to take a little bit more, but strength training I can do on anybody. It is extremely moldable. I could shape it in any particular way I want. If I'm using bands and free weights in particular, doesn't matter how tall, short, 
you are, doesn't matter how your body's built, the weights, the resistance follows you, not the other way around. So um, it's one of those forms of exercise that anybody could do. I can't say that about anything else, mm. right? Cycling, running, yoga, even swimming is inappropriate uh, for absolutely everybody. But strength training I can do, I mean, literally, you, you take somebody who's very, very, uh, let's say, um, deconditioned or in a state of needing rehab, simply trying to squeeze their hand with force would be a form um, of strength training. So, uh, and that makes it such a, 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 ver a valuable form of exercise. But yeah, when it comes to movement, all movement is healthy. The best way to apply movement just for movement's sake is to find ways to inject it into your everyday life. This is just going to be the most sustainable way um, that you end up uh, improving your health. The old, I used to scoff at this as, uh, as an early trainer. And I apologize to all those first clients that I had because I wasn't great at what I did. But people would say things like, oh, I, I try to park at the end of the parking lot. Or I try to take the stairs instead of the elevator. And I'd, oh, I'd laugh at that because you're not sweating. Right? No, no. That's exactly what you should do on a daily basis is just find ways to do what you're going to do anyway, but move a little more. Okay. It could literally be, I'm watching TV for an hour. I'm going to stand for 20 minutes while I watch it. That's a little bit of extra movement. Uh, it could be parking further away. It could be taking the stairs instead of the elevator. It could be playing with your kids and rather than laying on the floor, you stand up and play with them. This is what I do, right? My, I'm a dad in my mid forties. I have, uh, I have four kids, two real little ones. And I find myself sometimes at the end of the day, creating games that require me to lay on the floor cause I'm tired. Right. So <laughs> it's like a, it's like a dad hack when you're tired, but I get up and I say, you know what? I should, I should move, uh, stand up a little bit and get some extra activity. That's the best way, uh, to inject activity into your life. And then when you get to diet, boy, I'll tell you what, nobody approaches diet the right way. No one. Everybody gets stuck in the minutia of the what, you know, what macronutrient does what, and these foods do this, and that food does that, and you need to avoid this, and you get that. And everybody's forgetting the most important part when it comes to food. The thing that humans um, most are challenged with, the thing that connects us to food the most. It has nothing to do with calories, macros, and micronutrients. Nothing to do with that. It's all about our uh, our relationship with food. That's what food means to humans. It doesn't mean anything else. It does have macronutrients and nutrients, stuff like that. And luckily, we know what that is and we can study it. But humans have been eating food way before we understood that. It's about celebration. It's about how I feel. Um, it's about how it may numb me, distract me, make me present. It's how it, it's it's how we share um, community. It's how we connect with other people, and we ignore that. We focus all about all on the the ones and zeros, like we're robots. Here's your this is what you should eat. Plug this in and do it. It's not going to work that way. Mm. One uh, quick note about strength training, and then I'd love to move on to diet since you brought sure. it up. So you know, I think about like my my mom and my dad. You know, my dad. Uh, they're like my mom is about to turn seventy next year. My dad is like early 70, 73, I think. And they're really religious about walking mm. and they do a great job. You know, I got them both Apple watches. We kind of like track and just a rough proxy. And I nudge my mom a little bit. My dad is like a pro at it. He loves to rack up the steps. He lives in down in San Diego. He does a big morning walk in the morning, like loves to get up early and walks with his neighborhood friends. So it's like community time. It's a group of other men, a couple women, and they kind of go around this little loop. And he gets in probably before 6 a.m., 6.30. He's already at like you know, 15,000 steps, right? And then he usually loves to, just because he's a type of guy who likes to be out and about, he gets another like 10 to 15,000 steps on one or two other walks later in the day. Oh, that's great. Like really dialed in, you know? And I was chatting with my dad recently. I was like, dad, this is amazing. Like for sure. And this is the community component too. Awesome. And maybe just twice a week, give me like 30, 40 minutes we're going to have uh, my brother-in-law who's really in, into strength training and has been for a while. He's a cardiologist, Dr. Neil Patel, lives in San Diego. And my parents live down there with him and my sister. And I was like, we're going to take the trainer that Neil got for my nephew, right? They're just doing very like basic stuff. My mm -hmm. nephew's like 12 years old, you know, but they're getting the fundamentals of just awesome. like some training. 
and, and just 30 to 40 minutes, even if you don't have the time, and I know my dad does, we can even just that day you don't do one of your third walk, mm -hmm. right? Just give me that like 30 to 40 minutes and doing a little bit of strength training. Let's see how that goes for like a month, right? How does that make you feel? Does that make you feel excited? Do you feel more energy? Like, let's talk about it all. And he said, yes. And so we're basically starting this month and my mom getting her to join along is yeah. a little bit of a, like, you know, I kind of have to get a little bit more excited about it. But it just uh, goes back to this idea that I think my parents, uh, obviously all the walking is fantastic, right? It's, it's a great source of movement in their life. And genuinely from their standpoint, they, being the age they are and just the media that they were exposed to, they thought like, wow, we're nailing it. And mm -hmm. they are definitely, they're getting way more steps than most people. But they thought like, that's kind of the epitome is like, how much can we walk inside of a day? right? Mm -hmm. And if we can blow past the 10,000 steps and get into the 20 and the 30,000, we're doing fantastic. But they kind of didn't hear the latest news, like a lot of us, including myself, I didn't get serious about this until a couple of years ago, that just a little bit of strength training could actually get them even more closer to some of their goals. Now at the age they're in, they want healthy longevity. They want they want to be healthy. They want to be still active and excited for grandkids in the future and being able to do all the different components and put the bag on the, you know, airline above their head without needing help. And, um, and it's really been that it's like, just give me a little bit of time and that strength training, let's see how it goes. And I can imagine they're going to have the same experience I did is that you're just going to feel more activated in all aspects of your life. Yeah. hundred percent. There's a couple ways that they could approach it too. You could do it that way, which is how most people would do it couple days a week, uh, learn how to do it. You know, um, exercise is a skill or movement, I should say, is a skill. Strength training is no different. So when you do strength training exercises, don't view them like, um, this is going to work my legs. This is going to work my back. This is going to work my shoulders. So I have to feel those muscles. Nothing necessarily wrong with that, but you're better off if you look at the exercise like a skill and say, I'm going to get better at squatting, or I'm going to get better at the skill of rowing, or I'm going to get the better at the skill of overhead pressing, for example. Doing that is, is far better. You'll get more out of the exercises. You're more likely to do them appropriately. You're less likely to ignore negative signs that your body may be telling you. Because a lot of people, they'll do that, right? They'll go do squats. And rather than being like, okay, this is a movement I need to perfect. It's like, well, can I make it feel, can I feel it in my legs? And can I do this as, as, mm. as many times as I can? So if you practice some like skills, you're gonna do, you're gonna be uh, way better off. So working with a trainer instructor is incredible when you first get started to learn the skills of these movements. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it, and there's not only there's is there nothing wrong with what I'm about to say, it's probably more effective. Well, I think it's more effective from a behavioral standpoint, but it may even be, and we have some data now that's showing this, it may be even be more effective just in terms of results. So instead of doing, let's say, two 45-minute workouts a week, what if they did 12 or 15 minutes of strength training every day? I mean, same total time, if you did the math, right? I don't know if I did the math there, right? But if you did the, the same total time divided over every day versus just two days a week, would you get the same results? Yes, and I would argue probably even better. Mm. Let's talk about the behavioral uh, aspect of that. First off, developing a habit, you're more likely to develop a consistent habit if it's something you can repeat on a regular basis. You're also more likely to develop a habit if it's something that is easily injected into your day and you get you, you have a positive experience with it. It doesn't feel like it's too much. Taking 45 to 50 minutes out of your day twice a week doesn't sound like a lot, but for some people it's like, okay, Wednesday we got this thing we got to go to and then we got this other thing we got to go to on mm. Friday versus, oh, here's my 13 minute routine that I do in the morning or in the middle of the day or at night and I do it every single day type of deal. But here's why it may actually be more effective in terms of results. The practice element that I just mentioned. So instead of let's say doing, you did you know six or seven sets of let's say body weight squats uh, between let's say Wednesday and, and, and Friday or Wednesday and Saturday, okay? What if I did, I don't know, a set or two every day. I'm going to learn that skill a little bit better. More I'll, at bats. More at bats. And I'm going to learn it a little bit better. I, I don't have to deal so much with fatigue. Here's what's interesting about strength training. A lot of people don't realize fatigue is your enemy when it comes to building muscle and strength. 
That's not the case when, when you're trying to build endurance. If I'm trying to build endurance, especially competitive endurance, well, I have to train and, and, and approach and train through fatigue, right? I have to train my body to learn how to be fatigued and to, uh, to fatigue at later points. I have to get better at that. With strength training, I'm just trying to get stronger. Fatigue actually gets in the way. Too much fatigue will make your strength training turn into endurance training. So like if I took five exercises uh, with weights and I did them all with no rest, like people like to do in a circuit, okay? That's not strength training. It's just cardio with weights, okay? Mm. Strength training requires rest periods. And to not, not to get too deep into the weeds, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to work with the anaerobic energy system of the body not the aerobic energy system of the body. The anaerobic uh, energy system, you know, I'm burning ATP. This is uh, the main source of energy for every cell, but it burns out very quickly. And then I move into, you know, glycolytic energy, right? Glycogen, okay? Um, nothing wrong with that, but if I'm trying to build strength, I want to train within, because strength is an anaerobic thing, okay? I want to train that anaerobic energy system. That's why if you watch strength athletes, they do a set, and then they rest for two or three minutes. And then mm. they do another set and then they rest, okay? When I divide my workouts uh, over the week, and in this case, we're using 10 to 15 minutes, even advanced athletes can do this. Instead of doing three workouts, you know, two hours uh, a day, they could do an hour a day, for example, or something like that. Um, I'm not as fatigued. I'm more, I'm training within that anaerobic phase uh, much more effectively. So now your dad, let's say, he wakes up and he does two sets of squats, maybe two sets of push-ups, a set of planks, and he's done. He's done in 15 minutes. And let's say the next day he does, I don't know, a couple sets of lunges, maybe he does some overhead presses, maybe he does some band rows, and then he's done. And he does something like that every single day, right? Some, some exercise that is training, let's say the lower body, some pushing and some pulling, maybe some rotation or something to strengthen the core. He does that every single day. He's gonna get phenomenal results. He's gonna feel like he's not even doing much at all. He's like, this is, I don't know, I feel so great. I'm only doing 15 minutes, this is so strange. But he's gonna get uh, gr great results from doing it. So that's that's the other approach that you mm. can communicate uh, so, to your parents. Question for you since I have you here. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure this will benefit a lot of people who are listening as well, not just people who also want to help their parents. You know, you get healthy and yeah. you're younger. The um, One of the first things you're thinking about is that, how do I support my parents totally. too? Not just because you want them to be healthy, but a healthier parent also means you less involved in their care. Yeah. It's a selfish and selfless thing at the same time. Like I want my parents to be as healthy as possible and they want to be as healthy as possible because we've been through taking care of grandparents who are very unhealthy and it's cumbersome. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a lot. Obviously, you still do it. You love them. You're there for them, but you want them to be in the best shape that they possibly can be. So the instance of like my dad and mom, my dad was very active in sports. He used to play cricket and other things like that. My mom, a little less active, minus like walking and things like that. Um, at one point in time, there was like, I think they were called like, what were the gyms that were set up that were just for women and only women could go to them? Curves. Was, curves. Yeah. Yes. I think she was yeah. at one of those for a little while, um, which didn't last. didn't last. So- for them, they feel very kind of intimidated in the feeling of sure. like, I literally just don't even know what to do. Mm -hmm. Like, do they know what a plank is? Yes. Or is my dad worried about doing it wrong? No. But then he would be like, all right, what do I do next? Mm -hmm. Right. Kind of mm -hmm. feel, would can feel confused about it. My mom would feel, oh, actually, like, I don't know. I might have to modify it a little bit. I mm -hmm. might have to do this. So would it be in that instance, would you still recommend them starting and doing these activities on their own or should they still start with a trainer? But work with that trainer and tell them, hey, and we have a great trainer, you know, that that's working with my family down there. Hey, we really want to find something that we can teach my parents to do. That is this, you know, routine that takes 15 minutes, but it could be every single day. So help them sort of learn these activities and do it the right and help them correct their form. But then they're doing it on their own when on the days that you're not there. Is that how you'd approach it? Absolutely. Um, hiring a coach, a good coach or a good trainer is extremely invaluable. The money that you invest with them, if they do a good job, will last you um, and pay dividends for the rest of your life. So a good coach and trainer, what they'll do is they'll try to they'll look at your movement patterns. They'll try to um, get your body to move in a way that's a little bit more optimal. So your risk of injury is much lower. A lot of us develop movement patterns that are not 
so great, especially if we sit a lot or we do, you know, certain uh, movements repetitively. So you take somebody, for example, who's inactive and you have them try to do a squat and they're not going to squat in a way, they're not going to have the skill of squatting down very well. And so if they do that over and over, risk of injury goes through the roof and the exercise isn't nearly as beneficial. So a good coach or trainer will look at that person and say, okay, you have, let's say forward shoulder or forward head or a really strong anterior pelvic tilt, or I notice this asymmetrical shift that's happening. Let's identify these things. Let's strengthen your body so it can move in a little more balanced way. And let me teach you what it feels like to do these basic movements so you understand the skill of it and you can practice the skill of it. Um, that's what you'll get from a good coach or trainer. Now, thankfully today, we have YouTube. Um, you know, you can watch videos, you can practice them. If you approach the exercises, like I said, like their skills that you're trying to learn, you'll, you're going to be uh, far better off at getting to the point where you can do them well than you would as if you looked at them like workouts. Like, you know, I, I love telling this story because uh, this was like, and there's so many times I had epiphanies as a trainer. This one was a big one for me. I was hiking in the foothills uh, in Northern California by, by where I live. And um, as I was hiking, I, the runners would pass me up. And as a trainer, it's really hard not to notice biomechanics. It's just something you do. So you see someone running and you can see, oh man, that person's feet are pronating really bad or wow, that's a really strong anterior pelvic tilt. They're going to be hurting later. And I remember everybody that walked by, it was just, I would notice these things. And then somebody ran by that just, they looked like a gazelle. They were just floating as they ran by. It's like, man, that, that looks amazing. And I remember thinking like, holy cow, like humans, we're not very good at almost anything physically when you compare us to other animals, except for one thing, we can out track or outrun for distance, almost any other animal. A lot of people don't know this. Humans, fit humans uh, are excellent at just running for distance. In fact, this is how hunter gatherers hunt. They'll throw something at an animal, wound it, and then they'll just run after it until it gets tired. And I thought, but yet here we are trying to run and nobody could do it right. Everybody's running terribly. It's the number one cause of injury when it comes to exercise. And then it dawned on me. It's because it's a skill that we've all forgotten. Mm. We all run when we're kids and then we stop. And your body loses these skills. It's not just the muscle you lose. Your brain prunes neurons and neural connections uh, for skills that it deems no longer necessary. So when people lace up the running shoes... Nobody thinks to themselves like, okay, I'm going to put my shoes on and I'm going to go learn the skill of running again. They just go run until they're tired. And what happens when you do that is you have a bad movement pattern because you lost the skill of running. And then you strengthen that poor movement pattern by doing it really hard until you get really tired. And so you end up developing and strengthening this really terrible movement pattern. People do this with strength training as well. They'll watch a video on YouTube and they'll say, oh, push-ups. That's for the shoulders, the chest, and the triceps. And yeah, I really want to work on the back of my arms. Then they'll get on the floor, having not done a push-up for, I don't know, 10 years or ever. And they'll do them until they're super tired, mm -hmm. okay? Terrible technique for them. The skill isn't there. They feel the muscle. They think they're doing a great job. But what they're doing is they're strengthening a, a terrible movement pattern. They're making the exercise not safe and not effective. Instead, what you should do is view exercises like you're watching someone swing a club, you know, playing golf. Like nobody goes out and says, I want to get better at golf and just swings as hard as they can, as fast as they can until they get tired, right? That would not make you a good golfer. They go slow and they practice each step and how do I do this right? And let me get good at this. View these exercises the same way. Okay, that's what a squat looks like. Let me try it. Well, if I go down any further than this, looks like my knees start to cave in. My heels come up. I feel it in my back. So I'm not going to go down that far. I'm going to practice the part that I can do well. And then I'm going to test myself again next time to see if I could do it a little deeper and do it right. And then over time, you develop the skill. But guess what else is happening over time? You're getting stronger. You're building more muscle. Mm. You're getting the benefits. You're not getting the potential negatives or the risks of injury. So that's how I would communicate it to the average person or to your parents. I'd say, try these exercises try to perfect the skill of them, and don't worry about working out. You know what I want you to do, mom? I want you to, uh, every day, practice sitting down and standing up out of a chair really slow and controlled. That's a squat. Mm. Right? That might be a great way to start. So mom, when you sit down, don't let your knees cave in. 
and don't just plop down on the floor. See if you can lower yourself real slow and gently touch the seat and then sit down and then stand up and do that until you notice it's, your form is kind of off. And maybe that's five reps. Maybe that's 10 reps. Who knows? Practice that and say, okay, now we're going to try a push up. I don't think you're going to be able to do this on the floor. That's kind of a high level version of a push up. Try it over here on the desk or the table. Go down real slow and controlled until you feel like it's not controlled anymore. And then come back up and practice that. When you get better, try to get a little lower. And then when you can do that perfectly, go on a lower table or a chair and then eventually onto the floor. And if you do it that way, well, now you're training yourself. Now you're doing mm. it the right way. For those that are out there trying to convince you that carbs is the reason that you've gained weight or too much sugar inside of the diet, obviously all carbs get breaking down, broken down to sugar, or fat is the reason, it's really fundamentally, you have to have excess calories if yes. we're talking about ongoing weight gain. It's a lot more complicated on that, but without the excess calories, you're just not going to be adding the extra weight. That's correct, 100%. And you're going to erase a lot of the issues associated with, uh, with, those, with the consumption of those things. Look, there's populations in the world that eat a whole food-based diet that are super high in carbohydrates. Um, and they do, they're extremely healthy. And then there's other populations in the world that eat a very high fat. Uh, you look at the, the traditional Inuit diet, right? So it's like very high fat, uh, high protein diet, almost no carbohydrates. They're very healthy as well. They don't overeat. That's what it is across the board. So, and again, that's the challenge. Like if you, if you live in this world, this modern world, um, the big challenge is how do I not overeat? Because the, everything around me is designed, you know, markets are amazing, but they're also could be dangerous because they give us what we want. They don't necessarily give us what we need. And what do we want? We want enjoyable food. We want food that, man, every time I take a bite, I am just excited to eat this meal. And so markets have done that. They've invested a lot of time and energy into making foods so palatable that it's, you have to white knuckle your way through uh, and, and try to eat an appropriate amount of calories. If you stick to whole foods, try overeating. I dare you. If you eat a whole food, high protein diet, you probably won't overeat. In fact, it'll be very difficult to do so. Well, what you were hinting at before where people showcase that, hey, listen, you can eat at McDonald's every single day, every single meal, and still see improvements. Those individuals that might be running those experiments are staying within the appropriate That's calorie right. range for them. But there's this whole movement now, and maybe Tessa, we could Google this. Uh, just Google like ultra processed foods can be healthy. Yeah. I'm sure you've seen this. Yeah. So Guardian here, for those that are watching, some ultra processed foods are good for your health. Uh, WHO backed study finds. And I believe this is the yeah. one that I came across. I don't know, was this article I might've seen on CNN. Yeah. But the argument there that some of these researchers have been making is that, hey, listen, the world is so addicted to ultra-processed foods. In the United States, upwards of almost 70% of our calories are coming from ultra-processed foods. The rest of the world, especially Middle East, India, other countries are following in suit. Mm -hmm. So we have to teach people how to be healthy eating these ultra-processed foods. In one way, you're saying that, okay, sure, if you stick to a certain calorie range, but the problem is, Good luck trying to do that over the course of your lifetime. Yeah. So let me be very clear. Okay. Ultra processed foods are not inherently unhealthy. Although a lot of them are, you can make a, a food that is, uh, somewhat healthy. You now it's fortified with nutrients. It's got a good macro breakdown. Um, so you could look at something and go, okay, this if consumed appropriately, right. In the context of a you know, a calorie count that's right for me, this will be healthy. Yes. Yes, that's true. Also ultra processed foods have a long shelf life. There's value to that. Okay. You try delivering food to corners of the world where people are hungry, try delivering them fresh fruits and vegetables and meats, and you run into some serious problems, right? By the time it gets there, 60% of the food has gone bad and it's expensive. And so I get that, right? I understand that. And there's value in that. So I'm not saying destroy processed foods. Okay. What I'm trying to say is this is the argument. And what they try to do, by the way, is they try to twist the argument. And, and, and now you may be wondering, and we'll, we'll veer off for a second. Why are they making these arguments? 
process the processed food market is extremely profitable. There are there's huge incentives to keep the average person eating a 70% processed food diet. Now, why is it so profitable? Well, if I take a potato, I can't patent the potato. Every you can grow potatoes, I can grow potatoes, we could sell them. I can't patent mine and sell it and make it special. But if I take that potato and combine it with some other ingredients and make a potato snack, well, now you can't copy me. I can patent it. I can protect it. So processed foods uh, in markets uh, can be very, very valuable and very profitable. Whole foods, maybe with the exception of genetically modified foods, which can be uh, protected by patent, which is a whole other conversation. Um, largely, the margins are tiny. You know, uh, grow beef, sell beef, grow corn, you know, a, a non-GMO corn, grow, you know, rice, potato, carrots. The margins are small because I can't protect my product. Everybody can grow them. So there's a lot of incentives to put information out there. And this is, I wouldn't call it disinformation, but it is misinformation in the sense that, yes, if your calories are within the range they're supposed to, if you're getting adequate proteins and fats and nutrients, can it be healthy compared to a diet that lacks those nutrients or a high calorie diet? Yes. Yes. Here's the problem. And I'm not talking to the person who's struggling to get food, who's like, oh my God, I'm starving. Thank you for delivering this bread or this, you know, spam or whatever. Right. I understand that. I'm talking to the average person. Most of us in modern societies don't, we don't have a starvation problem. Let's be very clear. More people are going to die from overconsumption and obesity by far than underconsumption. Starvation is not an issue, really, in modern society. So that's who I'm talking to. And what I'm saying is, if you want to be healthy, be aware. Be very aware that these foods will make you overeat. Or you're going to have to count your calories every single day and play that game. And in my experience, that's not a long-term strategy. It sucks. It's hard. It's too hyper aware and counting and tracking and it makes food and diet become stressful and stress does not contribute <laughs> to healthy eating habits. It does the opposite. And so you find this, you find people counting calories and counting everything that they put in their mouth. And I'm eating these processed foods from this company that tells me that if I buy their frozen foods and just eat them, I'm going to be healthy. The fail rate on them is terrible. It's they, everybody fails at some point. Like I just want to go I don't want to be stressed out. I don't want to count every calorie that goes into my mouth. Well, what I'm saying, and the data will back me up, is you don't have to. Pay attention to your protein. That's about it. Avoid heavily processed foods for the most part. And you will naturally, unless you have some really bad relationship with food issues, which some people do have, and I respect that. I understand that. It's another challenge. But for most people, if you just did that, you're not going to get shredded. You're not going to walk around with a six-pack but you're going to fall within a healthy body fat percentage. So for a man, you're probably going to be around 15, 16% body fat. If you do that, you'll naturally fall in that place. And for women, you're probably going to fall somewhere in the low to mid twenties with body fat percentage. You're not going to have people walking around 60, 70, 80 pounds over eight, overweight if they follow that advice. Mm. I don't know if you've seen this, but there's some clips that are floating around, different experts saying this, but People saying that the number one driver of belly fat is high cortisol. Yeah. Have you seen this? I have. Around there? I have. And I think that knowing some of the people that are out there that are saying this, of course, you've mentioned that weight gain has multiple different aspects to mm -hmm. it. Part of what I feel is that we're doing a little bit of disservice to individuals by making them feel that stress is the primary driver of weight gain when just hearing what you shared earlier, which is that you have to have the excess calories first. Not mm -hmm. that stress can't play a major role in it. What's your take on this whole clip? Okay. Um, the are how hormones affect fat storage, muscle gain, behaviors, mood is very complex. Hormonal imbalances can definitely drive unhealthy behaviors. So let's start with that, right? So if you're a man and your testosterone levels, let's say are low, you've got cortisol levels that are inappropriate. And I use the word inappropriate. I don't use the word high because you want high cortisol in the morning. You talk to any hormone specialist and a, a healthy cortisol level comes up in the morning, peaks, and then starts to drop throughout the day so you can go to sleep. 
inappropriate cortisol levels are typically the opposite. They're low in the morning. I need tons of caffeine to get myself to wake up. And then, oh, oh now I'm stressed out another high and I can't sleep at night. That's a, that's a common inappropriate cortisol level. But in hormone levels that are off are, although they cause things, they cause things that happen in your body and, and they can drive behaviors. They're the result of something else. They're they're Again, it's a smoke. Okay. So what's causing my hormone levels to be all over the place? Well, poor lifestyle, bad sleeping patterns, uh, abusive stimulants or sedatives, bad diet, not exercising properly. Like not exercising will really cause hormones to, to not be in optimal ranges. Like men, we know this, like if you don't exercise, your testosterone levels will probably drop. Your androgen receptor density will probably, will definitely go down. We know when women will see these changes in estrogen and progesterone that are not so balanced. Now, when cortisol level when cortisol levels are inappropriate, there is evidence to suggest that it can change fat storage patterns. Okay, it can definitely do that. There is a lot of debate as to how big of a difference it's going to make. So, so let's say you're a female and you typically store body fat in the way that women do, which is around the lower body. Um, it's probably not going to all of a sudden make you just store body fat in your belly. And, you know, like it's not going to change everything radically. Um, that's what the data seems to suggest. But here's why I think people are hitting that, uh, that button. Because if I say cortisol is the problem, cortisol, 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 what typically follows is my solution, which is a cortisol lowering supplement. Take ashwagandha, take this, lowers cortisol. Here's my, here's my patented whatever that's going to fix the problem. The real answer to hormone imbalances is to lead a life that is healthy. And what you'll find is the hormones will follow. Now, there are cases where that doesn't happen, in which case there's something else that's underlying. But for the most part, if you live a, a lifestyle that is balanced and healthy, you're going to have hormone levels that reflect that. So I don't think it's fair to take somebody who's you know 50 pounds overweight Oh, look, you store around a lot around your belly. Let's test your hormones. Wow, your cortisol is all over the place. Here's this medication to fix your cortisol, right? Why don't we say you're not exercising? Let's start doing a little bit of activity. Let's look at your diet. Okay, it looks like you're not consuming adequate protein. It looks like you're consuming a lot of heavily processed foods. Let's work on that a little bit. Wow, let's look at your sleep. Your sleep doesn't look very good. You're not averaging about eight hours a night. You go to bed at different times uh, during the week. You wake up at different times. You're using maybe too many stimulants. You know, I can make a long list here. We don't do that. Instead, we say, oh, your hormone. Like if you're a man, I'll, I'll use a d different example. You're a man. You go to the, you go get your testosterone levels checked. Oh, look, you have low testosterone. Let's put you on testosterone replacement therapy. You'll feel better, but it's a Band-Aid. Uh, if that man is not exercising, has a poor diet and poor sleep, like if you fix those, 80% of men will see a significant improvement in their testosterone levels. So I don't, I don't like that message. Uh, I've worked with people for, for decades. I've worked with hormone doctors. Changing lifestyle often moves things in the right direction and often takes care of those problems trying to take care of those problems with band-aid solutions like hormones or supplements. Um, you'll, you'll notice some positive effects in terms of how you feel, but it's not really fixing the problem. So if, if cortisol is causing your body fat to store bo uh, your, your body to store body fat in a way that is different than a way that it used to changing your lifestyle, not only will make you leaner anyway, but should reverse that. Yeah, I think the other part that feels a little disingenuous with it is that even the people that have nothing to sell, what feels disingenuous is that, hey, the reason that we're all, as a society, so fat is because we're so stressed out. Yeah. And that's what's causing the cortisol levels. Yeah. But if we put you in a all expenses paid retreat for the entire year, yeah. but just kept on feeding you excess calories and excess calories from especially ultra processed foods, you're still going to gain weight yeah. no matter even if your cortisol levels are in the ideal situation. Yeah, you know what's interesting about stress? We First of all, you need stress. So we need to stop demonizing stress. Stress uh, is a, it signals the body to adapt. Okay, so exercise is stress. If you took a blood test on me or anybody else post-workout and you didn't know I exercised, you would think, uh-oh, this is not good. We got inflammatory markers going up and 
something's wrong with this person. We need to make sure we get them to the hospital so it'll look good because you didn't know I exercised, okay? Sunlight is a stress. Um, uh, you know, eating, there, there are components in food that have a hormetic effect that cause you to become healthier because they're a stress. Uh, it, you need some, in fact, sauna, cold water immersion, um, behavior specialists will tell you this. We need challenge in life to feel some kind of meaning. Okay. Like people think if we were given everything we ever needed and we live these plush lifestyles that we would suddenly feel amazing. You know, look, here's, here's all the evidence you need. Okay. It's the year, you know, we're, we're in the, we're in an advanced age. Okay. More people have more stuff than they've ever had. More people have shelter and food and clothes. We have too much stuff. And yet anxiety is higher. Depression is higher. Like what is going on here? It's not the stress. It's uh, how we handle the stress. It's how we perceive the stress. It's a lack of meaning and purpose in our lives that's causing the problem. It's not the that we have necessarily too much. We might have too much stress for how we handle it, but we also need to look at how, like, for example, let's talk about physical stress. Okay. If you exercise regularly and you're fit, your body can handle physical stress more than somebody who's not fit and healthy. If you took somebody who's sedentary and you took someone who's fit and you stress their body out by having them, let's say walk 20 miles, You'll notice that the fit person, they're probably going to feel okay. The person who doesn't, it, 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 was, it would be too much. Walking 20 miles would be too much. They might even get an injury as a result. This is true for emotional, spiritual stress as well. And so uh, it's far more complex is what I'm trying to say. I don't have the answers, but what I'm trying to say is it's far more complex than we just have too much stress in our life. You know what's funny about that? Uh, my, I'm, a, I'm the product of, of poor immigrants. Okay. You know, I talked to my, my grandfather passed away, but I remember when I used to talk to him about how he grew up, you know, nine siblings, they grew up in a room probably as big as this, that they shared with the donkey that his dad owned, because that's how he was able to provide for the family. Um, they were extremely poor at nine years old. He was working hard labor. He came to this country, had to figure it out. Um, and you know, if I went to him and I said, you know, Hey, no, no, um, man, I'm really stressed out. <laughs> you know what I did today? I talked on three podcasts and we talked about health and fit. I'm oh, man, I'm so stressed out. Like I would feel embarrassed to tell him that like, what's, ha- what's, what's the difference? You know, I think they had a uh, tighter, uh, community. I think they had values. I think they had a lot of meaning and purpose in their life. So not to shame anybody, um, you know, and obviously, yes, I still feel stressed myself. I just think it's a lot more complex than we have too much stress in our lives. I, you know, honestly, you know what helps me a lot? If I don't go on my phone all day long, I feel like I can handle so much more stress. You know, how, how interesting is that? Yeah, it almost seems like a lot of our chronic stress is coming from overstimulation. Totally. You know, I think back in the day, and your family's from Italy, yeah, is that right? Yeah, Sicily. Sicily. Yeah. Do you know the story of... Rosetta. Do you know the story of Rosetta? No. Tessa, let's bring this up. So Rosetta, in the 1960s, there was a group of Italian immigrants that moved together to the United States. And they ended up in this town in Pennsylvania. And they literally ended up kind of recreating like an Italian village. Mm. You have all these families that are living with multi-generations in the same, you know, home, probably with a little bit more space than maybe many of them had, like the one room in Sicily or whatever. And um, they're living a traditional way of life within the American context. Many of them are starting to get jobs at different factories. They're farming, other things like that. And one of the local doctors who was servicing that town and a little neighboring town, because they were very small, he was at a conference one day getting a beer at like a local bar. And he was telling a researcher that he was sitting next to, he was like, you know, it's crazy. I'm like the doctor for this town, Rosetta in Pennsylvania. There has not been one person under the age of 65 that has died from cardiovascular disease. Mm. And this was the time that now cardiovascular disease was just starting to become more known. Mm. Time magazine, all these articles, you know, fat is causing heart disease. And the researcher was like, this is super interesting. We got to like look into this. We got to look into what's going on. 
So they started studying the town and they're like, okay, is it the water that they're drinking? Is it the food? And at that point in time, they were eating still a lot of the traditional meals, but the food had already started changing mm. in getting a lot more American meals and stuff because that's all they had access to. 1960s, like even to find olive oil in America hard. is super yeah. hard. Yep. So they're eating just whatever they can get access to. And then uh, as they continued to study them and look at them, uh, the next generation that was there, the the 70s, you started to have, uh, for the first time, people under the age of 65 in that town would die yeah. from cardiovascular disease. And that study continued. And ultimately, what they found is that it wasn't the food. It wasn't the water. It was essentially uh, the way that they were living. That in these towns, when they first moved here from Italy, you had multiple people in the same house yeah. that were there. You had these tight community bonds and these family relationships. The average male, when they first came here in the 60s, I believe, he was part of like three kind of different social groups that were there. And as increasingly people started to become more Americanized, they stopped living in the same home. They were distant from their sort of families. They weren't as social, didn't have as much downtime, weren't spending as much time outside. And all of a sudden, this idea of sociogenomics, how we live our friendships and how tight our bonds are in our relationships played a massive role. And this goes back to this idea that, you know, you mentioned when you stay away from your phone, you feel better. I think that those generations, even though they had a tougher life, right, they had less stimulation. They weren't as overstimulated and they also had tighter bonds. They had tighter family bonds. They had more downtime and they had more support system that was there. It was such a fascinating uh, effect that they researchers coined the term the Rosetta effect. Yeah. The way that you live could have that much of an impact on your health and if, lifestyle. If humans are anything, we're social animals. We're so social. Um, it's If you really think about it, like it's it's amazing how social we are. It's considered cruel and inhuman uh, punishment to to take a POW and put them in isolation. That's a Geneva Convention, that that's cruel, to put them in isolation, okay? We need each other. And what we've done is we've effectively separated ourselves so significantly. This is probably one of the main reasons why we're seeing all these issues with anxiety, with stress. Um, you know, we don't feel a sense of shared values or community. Um, and our phones are really a cheap substitute. They're the processed food of, of connection. You know, uh, Arthur Brooks, good friend of mine, who's an expert on this. He says that the, you, you talk to somebody through social media, you get the dopamine, but you don't get the oxytocin. Mm. So it's, it's not the same. It's literally not the same. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll use an example that because people might think like, I, we've been so conditioned to think that it's everything else and that that doesn't play a huge role. I'll use another example that tends to blow people away. Somewhat connected, but what age do you think people have if you, when they do surveys, at what age do people have the best um, body acceptance where they, they like their bodies? Hmm. I would probably have to guess later years. Yeah. Like 50 plus. You're, you're on it. Yeah. It's like uh sixties. Wow. You know, people would say, well, well, I mean, should be your early 20s. That's when you're young and you look the best. No, no, no. People are most satisfied with their bodies in their 60s. Now, why is that? Because it's not, has less to do with how you look. It has more to do with the wisdom that comes with, I think, getting older. I think, you know, look, I was, uh, you know, I was, I'm a child of the 90s, okay? I remember waiting in line at the grocery store and you just had to stand there. You ever wait in line now? Everybody's on their phone. There is no quiet time. There is no time to, this is why spiritual practices, uh, one of the reasons across the board have health benefits. I think a lot of it, not all of it, there's other things, but I think a lot of it has to do with the, you know, being present, centering yourself, being quiet. I mean, that's what prayer is, right? That's what meditation is. So yeah, putting your phone down, I think makes a big, makes a big, and the data now is starting to come out on the effects of social media and technology on kids. We didn't have this data because it just exploded onto the scene. And uh, we're seeing very negative effects. Here's the interesting thing. As I'm saying this, because I know I feel this when I hear it, people are like, oh, put my phone down. That should be a sign. 
right there. When I tell you, put your phone down and you're like, oh, I can't, I don't know if I want to do it. It's hard. Yeah. Well, that, that's a sign right there. Try doing it. Turn it off, put it down, and then just take note of, of how you feel. It's the ultimate distraction tool. We're constantly being bombarded. You know, our phones are extensions of markets. And again, I said this earlier, markets give us what we want, not what we need. And, you know, what do our primitive brains want? We want to be scared. We want to be alarmed. We want to be shocked. You know, we want to compare to other people. Look at your algorithm on your social media. Look at all the pictures that pop up. Is that really healthy for you? If you really think about it, probably not. You know, my space, the fitness space is notorious for this. Kid, people today, I'll, I'll tell you a stat that'll blow, that tends to blow people away. Did you know that six pack abs are more rare than millionaires? Mm. It's more rare to have a six pack than it is to be a millionaire. Now you go on social media, you wouldn't think that at all. You think everybody has a six pack. Look, I worked in gyms my entire life. That's a self-selection bias of fit people. Six packs are rare. Okay. They're very, very rare, but you wouldn't think so. You would go on social media and think, oh my God, everybody's beautiful. Everybody looks perfect. And now with AI, it's going to get much worse. Like turn it off or change your algorithm. Watch what happens to your mental health and your stress and your anxiety. So again, this is, uh, my, my expertise is in fitness and health. I've only, I'd say over the last five years, really dive deep into this because health, as I've learned, as I've done this longer and longer, isn't just exercise and diet. It's a, it's a lot of things. And I've had people on my show that are experts in this. And, uh, it's, it is a hundred percent true. You know, now in my forties, I'm practicing this. And I'm like, man, I wish I knew this when I was younger. It's having profound effects on myself. Wish mm -hmm. I knew this, you know, years ago. When it comes to the concept of losing weight and belly fat, instead of focusing on calories first with your clients, you actually focus on building muscle. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, 100%. So there's two reasons for that. Now, uh, let's, let's little context. So I trained everyday people as a personal trainer for over two decades. Um, and I had a deep passion, I still do, for helping people. Um, and so through that process, I mean, you're talking about 20 years, through that process, you start to kind of learn what works and, and what doesn't work. Now, there's what works in textbooks and in studies, and then there's what works in the real world. And what I mean by works isn't necessarily just do they lose weight, but rather are they able to keep it off and keep it off forever? Am I able to create a sustainable approach for this person and help them develop a relationship with exercise and nutrition that lasts uh, forever? Because a lot of people don't know this, but the fail rate uh, with weight loss is uh, close to 90%. So mm. the, the, we don't have a problem losing weight. We have a problem keeping it off. Everybody's focused on how do I lose it? Nobody's looking at the big problem, which is, okay, once I lose it, then what happens? And what's going on? Why can't we keep it off? And a lot of it has to do with how we lose the weight, the approach that we have. So the first reason, it's going to sound kind of silly, um, but the first reason why I would focus on, I guess, the fitness aspect or building muscle in particular was it was easier. It's easier for me to help you build muscle if you're seeing me two days a week as a trainer than it is for me to get you to alter and change your nutrition that you're going to deal with every single day when I'm there, when I'm not there when you're stressed, when you're tired, when you're at a party or whatever. So that's number one. Number one, let's start with the things that I know as a trainer or a coach, I have a little more control over and things that actually require less from you to get the ball rolling. So that's number one. But then here's number two. If I can get your body to build muscle, we could start to move your body in a more advantageous position from a few different standpoints. One, you become more, it's, it becomes more metabolically advantageous, okay? Uh, muscle burns calories. And if I can get your body to burn more calories, later on, it's gonna be easier to sustain because you can eat more and maintain a leaner body. Speed up your metabolism, if you will. I know, I know there's a lot of debate and discussion about how much you can speed up your metabolism. And we have studies that show that a pound of muscle only burns, let's say, X amount of calories. And some people argue it's more than that. I think it's far more complex um, than people um, realize. There, yes, muscle by itself burns more calories, but there is a flexibility, a metabolic flexibility that exists within our bodies with the current lean body mass that we have. Okay, so you can take somebody, have them gain no muscle uh, or lose no muscle, maintain the same, same lean body mass, but through other methods, through 
sleep, uh, changes in hormones, um, behaviors, um, uh, you know, how, what kind of signals you're sending your body. Do you want it to build muscle? Do you want it to conserve calories? You can burn more or less calories. And then on top of that, you have just the fact that more muscle burns more calories because it's so metabolically active in comparison to other tissues of the body. Like body fat's very easy to maintain. Muscle, much more expensive from a caloric standpoint. So when I get the person to start building muscle, I'm starting to also speed up the metabolism. In that process, as we start to talk about nutrition, the goal is not to take things away, but rather to add things to start to fuel or support, I should say, that new strength and that new muscle. Also, there's a behavioral component to that with the nutrition component, which is behaviorally speaking, people tend to be uh, better or it tends to be more successful telling someone to add something to their diet than it is to tell them to take away. Now, I know people who understand calories probably listening and saying that makes no sense. You want someone to lose weight, you're telling them to eat more. And I'm going to say yes, but uh, it's a bit of a sneaky approach. Um, so to give you an example... I would tell somebody, we're not going to cut your calories, but what I want you to do is I want you to eat 30 grams of protein uh, with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I want you to eat that first and then eat whatever else you want afterwards. Um, now, I know uh, as a trainer, and I'm sure you know this as well, and we know this now, the literature is pretty clear that protein is extremely uh, satiety producing. It fills you up. It makes you not want to eat anymore. It also tends to regulate blood sugar and blood sugar fluctuations tend to cause behavioral changes that tend to make us want to either overeat or eat things that tend to be hyper palatable, which then contribute uh, to overeating. So I would tell them to aim for 30 grams of protein and eat that first. And without them realizing it, they would end up eating less calories overall. Plus they get the protein that they need to fuel that muscle growth. Um, there's also a confidence that comes from seeing objective progress in the gym where yesterday you could do two push-ups, and today now you could do three or four. I would make sure to paint the picture for the client or point this out. And I would say things like, uh, you know, last week you were able to you know, lift 50 pounds, and this week you were able to lift 60 pounds. Do you know what that means? And they would say, well, I'm stronger. I said, yes, but fundamentally it means you're a different person. You're not the same person you were last mm. week. That's very powerful for somebody who's trying to change themselves uh, in fundamental ways. Um, and then there's the hormonal component that comes from the process of building muscle. And, and we can go, we can get into the weeds with this, but the one that I like to focus on has most to do with uh, insulin sensitivity. Muscle is very insulin sensitive. Um, in fact, there's studies that they've done with obese individuals where they have them lose no weight. They simply have them gain some muscle and we see significant improvements in insulin sensitivity. Muscle um, is a place where we store uh, glycogen, right? We could store those carbohydrates and sugars that we eat. Um, it's also insulin sensitive because insulin has an anabolic effect to it. So when you build some muscle, you become more insulin sensitive. Becoming more insulin sensitive means you're gonna have less of those ups and downs. And we know those ups and downs affect how we feel. And a big thing that we don't focus on when we talk about nutrition that I learned a lot as a trainer was how food makes you feel is paramount because mm. I could tell you what to eat all day long. I could give you the perfect amount of calories, grams of proteins, fats, carbohydrates. I could tell you all those things. But if you uh, have a relationship with food where if you feel irritable, tired, depressed, um, sad, whatever, you reach for something to comfort yourself. Well, if I can get you to feel a little bit better, you're more likely to make decisions, conscious decisions, eventually you become unconscious. So you could develop patterns, but initially you, you're more likely to develop or, or to, to make choices that are better for you. Um, and so these are, this was the beginning of the process, the beginning of the process. So you come hire me, I want to lose 30 pounds and I'm going to tell you, we're going to do that. But first, let's focus on getting you strong. And then from there, we'll see what happens. And it was a far more successful approach. So many powerful takeaways in that. I'd love to tease a few of those things out. But sure. first, I want to start off with this is that some people might be looking at you if they're watching on YouTube 
They might be thinking, okay, great, this guy's training other guys. But you told me while we were chatting initially that actually most of your clients yeah. initially to start were women. Yes, the vast so majority. This is something that is not just for men, but this is something that you've had proven experience with women in as as well. Yeah, no, I would say um over the two, you know, two, two and a half decades of training people and managing gyms, uh probably 70, 70 to eighty percent of my clients were were female. I didn't train in bodybuilder gyms. Um, I didn't work. I had some athletes um, that I worked with, but the vast majority of people I trained were everyday people. So these were big globo gyms that I managed and ran. These were people who had families and kids, and they worked and they want to lose weight and feel better, and they hired me and I worked with them. So that's the vast majority um, of my experience. You know what's interesting about the comment that you made, which. Um, uh, you know, I want to touch on, and this is just, it's very common. We've done a mass, and I say we, the fitness industry has done a massive, massive disservice to women. We have painted one of the most uh, effective and powerful and um, just easiest to sustain forms of exercise as a form of exercise for men who want to build big muscles. This is what bodybuilders do. This is what athletes do. All you other people want to be fit, healthy, and just lose weight. Don't pay attention to this. Uh, that other stuff is for those extreme, you know, meatheads, for example. Um, and that's terrible because, uh, you know, men and women have both been lied to by the fitness industry, but women far more so. I mean, I remember the first gym that I became a trainer of at the age of 18. I walked in there. This was a 24-hour fitness um, in San Jose, and it was one of their flagship clubs. I remember walking in there, getting hired, and um, there was a women's only area within the gym. They used to do this in gyms back in the in the 80s and 90s, right? And I walked into the women's area for the first time, because now I'm a trainer, so I can go throughout the whole gym. And um, the equipment in there was identical to the equipment that was out into the general floor. The difference was the upholstery was pink, and the dumbbells <laughs> were were covered in like some, you know, like uh, pink or purple rubber. And I remember thinking, even this as an 18 year old trainer, how condescending that we're, you know, we're telling women this is where they need to work out. And all we did was color it pink. And I remember that the information that was communicated, it's, you still hear this a lot to women was, um, you know, don't lift weights uh, like this, cause you'll get big and bulky and masculine. What you should do is grab those two pound dumbbells, do 5,000 reps, feel the burn. This is going to develop, uh, you know, sculpted, toned, you know, long, lean looking muscles. By the way, I love saying this. This always gets people if they haven't heard this before. Toned, uh, the way that the fitness industry uses it, is a completely invented, made up marketing term. Now, toned exists as a word. It just means uh, muscle's ability to contract or... But um, tone, the way we use it is like, it's different than building somehow. Like toning means you don't have big muscles. They're just nice and firm. Muscles build or they shrink. They don't tone. Uh, toning is just building to a smaller degree. So really what we're telling women to do is build muscle, but we just repackaged it in a way that was easier to sell. And then we changed workouts so that they weren't so afraid of maybe looking like, I don't know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or something like that. <laughs> um, so, but no, the, the majority of my clients were women. I loved, uh, you know, shattering their paradigms around uh, exercise and how to approach it. And um, I became very successful in doing so and creating um, behaviors um, and routines for people that they were able to maintain. And my favorite comment that I would get from people, I love hearing this and it became quite common after was they would come to me and say, Sal, I'm getting leaner but I don't feel like I'm working that hard. Like, this is really weird. Like what's happening? How is my body working this way? And I tell them, I say, you know, the difference is what you did before or what you were doing before is you were fighting against your body. And every time your body would send you a signal that what you were doing wasn't working so well, you just pushed it harder. Um, what we're doing is we're working with your body's natural abilities to adapt. We understand how they work. We work with them so that the time you do spend in here is effective and efficient. And we're getting your metabolism and your hormones to work in a way to where you don't have to kill yourself every day in the gym. You don't have to starve yourself every day to try to be fit and healthy. This is something that's sustainable. So 
again, one of my favorite things to hear from people is that that quote right there. That's incredible. You know, some of what I'm really hearing from you and having kind of gone deep into your content over the last month as I've been anticipating this interview is that both for men and women, but in particular, I had shared with you that my audience skews female, that if you are really serious about wanting to lose a little bit of weight, and that obviously fits into the conversation of body composition, Yes, because anybody could lose weight just by not eating for a mm. short period of time or just way too much fasting, which is not good for you. But if you're serious about body composition, which the fat loss being a part of that and building muscle, yes. if you're not strength training in some capacity, and we'll go through that, I'd love to yeah. hear like if somebody's just started, okay, if they have a little bit of experience, you know, what's the best approach to that? We'll get to that in a second. You're really doing yourself a disservice because your only le levers that you're pulling are, you know, the diet side of things and maybe a little bit of stress if people are paying attention to that as well, right? You're doing yourself a disservice because you're not taking advantage of the fact that muscle does all these things that you talked about before. Yeah, so let's talk about weight for a second um, because people are so focused on the scale, especially women, uh, because the, they, we've looked at that number and that number to us means something. Um, I, I used to love telling people this. It's, I want to lose weight. And I'd say, okay, what kind of weight? And they'd look at me like, what are you talking about? So, well, we could cut your leg off and you'd lose <laughs> weight, but that's obviously not the weight that you want to lose. Now, of course, that's an extreme example, but Body composition is what matters. If you took a 150 pound woman at 35% body fat, let's say five foot four, and you took another woman who was five, four, 150 pounds, but her body fat percentage would say 20%, same body weight. They would look vastly different. They wouldn't even look the same. In fact, most people would guess that the 20 something percent body fat uh, female weighed a lot less. This is because muscle takes up less space than body fat on a pound for pound basis. Something like if you were to if you were to lose 10 pounds of body fat now and gain 10 pounds of body fat, excuse me, 10 pounds of muscle, so replace 10 pounds of body fat with 10 pounds of muscle, you would lose roughly a quarter of the size of your body, okay? So you weigh the same but you're a lot smaller. But there's more to it than just that. That muscle obviously makes you more mobile. So that's great. You're stronger, more functional, feels different on the body, looks very different on the body. Um, it is It improves your hormone profile. So it balances out things like estrogen and progesterone, growth hormone, helps modulate cortisol so it's more appropriate. Um, it helps regulate testosterone, which is also important in women, not just in men. By the way, testosterone in women, uh, same functions that you find in men. It helps with motivation. Um, it helps with, uh, you know, feeling drive, libido, you know, energy, those types of things. So that muscle does a lot of things, but you weigh the same, right? You weigh uh, the same. I used to have this trainer that worked for me, this female trainer that I used to use. Um, and it used to, we used to laugh about this. She was like one of my favorite sales tools because I would get a, a potential member of the gym that I'd give a tour to. And, and let's say it was a woman and we would talk about the gym and, uh, sometimes they'd say, oh, I'm not interested in the weights at all. I just want the machine, the cardio <laughs> and the aerobics classes. And we talk all about strength training and I would explain to them and they'd still be like, no, 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 I'm not interested. And then I would do this challenge. I'd say, okay, I'm going to call in one of my trainers. And if you could guess her body weight within 10 pounds, I'll give you a free membership for the next three months. And they would say, I'll take that challenge. And, it, and I'd page this trainer <laughs> and then she would, and she would walk in and she was like five, two, very sculpted, very fit. And I'd say, guess her body weight. And they would all guess like 100 pounds, 110 pounds. Then I'd have her stand on the scale. And I forgot how much she weighs, like 135 pounds. It always blow their mind. And I'd say, you know, muscle and body fat look very, very different. Um, so the scale just tells you total body mass. It doesn't tell you, you know, what it's made up uh, of. So I, I want to paint, at first I want to explain that because as we talk about muscle, I know people who are trying to lose weight, when they hear more muscle to them, they just feel like I'm gonna get bigger. Okay, I'm gonna be a bigger version of me just yeah. with more muscle. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Now let's talk about the weight loss approach. Um, the weight loss approach, if you look at it from its absolute most basic viewpoint, um, it's a calories in versus calories out equation. Now it's obviously far more complex than this. 
okay? Um, the human metabolism or mammalian metabolism is extremely complex. And calories in versus calories out is like telling somebody who is in poverty, just make more money and save more money, right? It's like way more complex than just that. But that part's still true. So the calories in versus calories out, that is true. What makes up what it makes up of or what makes you know what contributes to it is very complex. But let's talk about calories in versus calories out. We understood that uh, equation for a long time. And so we said, okay, we're dealing with an obesity epidemic. People want to lose weight. Uh, we need to reduce their calories and we need to have them burn more calories. So the calorie reduction part, let's have them eat less. Okay. That's what they said with diet. And we can get into that, but there's far more effective and less effective ways of doing that. But then they looked at the calories outside of the equation. And what they said was, okay, um, movement, movement burns calories. So let's look at all the forms of exercise and the most valuable ones would be the ones that burn the most calories. And that's what we're going to tell people to do. And it sounds like it makes sense, right? Like, okay, if, if I'm trying to lose weight, trying to burn more calories, um, I should just pick the form of exercise that burns the most calories. The problem with that is it completely negates a very important factor with exercise, which is exercise gets your body to adapt. And those adaptations mean a lot. They mean a lot. Okay. So if I pick a form of exercise that just gets me to burn a lot of calories, let's say running, that's phenomenal. Now I'm burning a lot of calories, except my body's adaptation process is going to say this. We need more endurance. We need more stamina. We need to conserve more calories. We got to be able to do this activity well and more efficiently. That's what your body is trying to do with that form of exercise. So you build stamina and endurance. You don't need much muscle at all for stamina and endurance. In fact, you need very little muscle for that. So what your body does to become more efficient or slow down its metabolism, lower its calorie requirements, is it actually starts to pare muscle down, especially when you combine it with low calories. And the studies are very clear on this. You diet and you run a lot, or you diet and you do tons of, let's say, calorie burning activity. You see weight loss, but a significant portion of that weight loss is muscle. Now there's a misconception that you're burning the muscle for energy. That's not what's happening. Your body doesn't like to burn muscle for energy, um, except in extreme situations. What it's doing is it's just, it's just paring it down. It's becoming more efficient. This is why, and by the way, uh, everybody, almost everybody who's ever tried to lose weight has probably tried that approach. They've experienced the following, that initial 10 pound weight loss and then hard plateau. What happened? I'm doing three days or four days a week of this activity, I'm eating this low calorie diet. Why did I plateau? What happened? Well, what happened was your body adapted and learned how to perform and operate on the lower calories and on the calories that you're burning with that activity. And it's very, very intelligent on how it adapts to that. Okay. There was this incredible study that was done. Uh, they, they actually went and studied a modern hunter gatherer tribe, the Hadza tribe. I'm sure you're familiar with it because people talk about it all the time. And scientists went down and studied them. And through some sophisticated testing, were able to figure out how many calories they burned on a regular basis. Now, remember these are hunter gatherers. Okay. So they don't have TVs and iPhones and they got to go hunt their food. They have to gather, they have to get water. They're far more active than the average Westerner. What they found at the end of the study was that they burned roughly the same amount of calories that the average Western couch potato burns. And you think, well, how's that possible? Well, uh, that's how we evolved. If humans burned six or 7,000 calories a day as hunter gatherers, we wouldn't be here. Mm. It is very hard to find calories in nature until we learned agriculture and you know we, we live in modern. Now it's easy, calories are really easy to find. But if you go out in the wilderness and you gotta hunt for your food and gather your food, you're not going to five, six, find, excuse me, 6,000 calories a day. Their body's adapted. So that's essentially what we're doing when we apply the wrong strategy to try to lose weight. Our bodies quickly adapt and nothing happens. And then what we do is we try to do more of the same. Well, I guess I need to do more exercise. I guess I need to cut my calories even more. Then you lose another seven pounds and you plateau again. And uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see how unsustainable this is. Well, what do I end up at the end of this journey? I lost 30 pounds, but I'm eating 1,100 calories a day. And five days a week, I'm on the treadmill for an hour. 
Mm. Most people don't want to do that forever. Or if they stop for a month, everything comes back on. It's miserable. Miserable. So what we should do with our approach with exercise is this. What form of exercise, forget the calorie burn while I'm doing the exercise, because that's inconsequential anyway. What kind of exercise is going to do the opposite? Like what form of exercise is going to teach my body or encourage my body to adapt in a way where it becomes less efficient with calories, where it wants to burn more calories on its own, where I don't have to constantly move to try to make this happen? Well, that's strength training. Nothing does it like strength training. The process of building muscle and building and having the extra muscle itself. By the way, it's not just the muscle. It's also the signal to build more muscle, both of which teach my body to burn more calories. And I would see this all the time with clients. I'd have a client who would lose 30 pounds and at the end of their weight loss journey was eating more than they did when they started. And, and, and here's the other side of strength training that's phenomenal. You don't need to do a lot of it. With strength training, the primary um, benefit is the adaptation, not the calorie burn. And for most people, that looks like a couple days a week, you know? Now, if you want to move into advanced strength training and really push yourself and compete in strength sports and all that stuff, well, then you're going to need more than that. But for the average person, you can get really far with what I'm talking about with like two days a week of appropriate strength training. So now I lost 30 pounds. I'm in the gym two days a week, maybe three days a week, and I'm eating more than I did before. That is a sustainable approach. That's the approach that I try to communicate uh, on my podcast. And that's the one I learned uh, with my clients. You know, I've heard you say that a lot of your clients would come in and initially their focus and their motivation is like, hey, I want to look better. Mm -hmm. It was focused on the sort of look thing. And then through following your methodology and having this approach of sustained strength training done in a way that doesn't make you feel burnt out. We're yeah. going to talk about that in a second. Doesn't make you feel miserable. Actually might give you more flexibility in terms of what you can eat because your muscle also might be allowing you to have a little bit more flexibility in your diet. We'll get back to that in a second. And, and all the other components that come in, they ended up at a place with, sure, they might have come in to look a little better and they ultimately ended up looking better mm -hmm. because of that shift in body composition. But what had them stick to this and make it sustained is actually this approach made them feel better. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, um, you know, we, the fitness space, social media now, but when I was a kid, it was magazines that we would read. It glorifies uh, workouts like they're battles, like you're going to war and you're beating yourself up and you're crawling out of the gym. And uh, by the way, if you don't do that, well, then your workout wasn't effective. We have to uh, reframe what exercise really is. Now, is there value in beating the crap out of yourself in the gym? Maybe sometimes. I mean, I think mental fortitude is important. We probably need more of that nowadays, but that's not what makes a workout effective at all. Exercise is simply a signal that tells your body to adapt in a particular way. So let's use another form of adaptation as an example, let's, uh, let's think of our body, our skin's ability to tan or darken when exposed to the sun. Would it be advantageous uh, to get a tan by going outside and sunburning yourself every day? So if I go out, I'm gonna, I need to go out there and burn really bad. That's how I'm going to get a suntan. No, of course not. If I did that, not only would I not get a tan, I would cause lots of damage. It would be miserable experience and I probably wouldn't want to do it anymore. Well, for some reason, we approach exercise this way. You're going to come into the gym, you've never worked out, or maybe you have a little bit of experience, and you're going to crawl out of the gym, or you're going to be so sore that you can't move for a few days, and yay, that was a, a great workout. No, all you've done is created a lot of damage, and you've completely overcome your body's ability to adapt. We Recovery and adaptation, by the way, are, are not the same thing. Um, they're, they're somewhat related, but they're not the same thing. We talk a little bit about recovery and that's important, but there's also our body's ability to, uh, overcompensate, become better at then with, uh, withstanding the same stress next time. Okay. So let me explain what I'm talking about. Recovery is healing. 
Adaptation is changing. It's overcompensating. It's, I scratch my skin, I cause a little bit of a abrasion, my skin heals over, that's recovery. Adaptation, I develop a little bit of a callus, okay? You can overcome your body's ability to adapt by just getting your body to want to heal, okay? Beat yourself up at the gym, you get sore, soreness kind of goes away, I go back to the gym and beat myself up again. No room for adaptation. I am literally on a hamster wheel. Recovery, damage, recovery, damage, no adaptation, okay? Some people take it even further and go beyond recovery. What we're looking for is the perfect amount of stress on my body to allow for the adaptation process to occur, occur. Now the question is, what is that perfect amount of stress? Well, boy, that's different for everybody, okay? If you don't exercise now, it doesn't take much at all to send the signal and to get your body to adapt, not at all. If you sit on your couch all day long, I could have you do 10 squats, which you never do, and those 10 squats will send a signal to get your body stronger and you will adapt and you'll get stronger. And as you get stronger, the stress begins to change. The stress starts to change. This process is a slow process, but it should feel good. It should not feel like you're surviving your workouts. You know, the other part of that is we people tend to approach exercise uh, or diet from this place of um, self-hate, right? Like the they get motivated to start working out because they saw a picture of themselves or they felt like they weren't attractive or inadequate. I'm fat, I'm too skinny, I'm unattractive. So the beating myself up initially is a bit cathartic as well. Like how many times have you heard this, right? Somebody um, goes to the gym, like, oh man, last night ate too much food. I gotta go sweat this out. I gotta go beat myself up. And then they leave and they feel like they can barely move and like that was a great workout, right? It's like this cathartic self-flagellation from <laughs> like punishment, right? Um, instead, try this. Uh, go to the gym and think to yourself, how can I take care of myself? What's going to care for me like somebody I care about, okay? That'll help you train yourself a little bit more appropriately. You should also feel more energy after your workout than you did before. You should leave the gym feeling better. This is when people figure this out, by the way, people like to work out in the morning. People who really figure this out like to work out before they go to work. Because they, when they do it, they go to work and they feel sharp and energized. I could tackle my day, I feel great. That's how you should feel after your workouts. You should not feel like you survived. You should feel like you thrived. Mm. That will, now it's of course, what makes up the workout and the exercises and all that we could talk about. But what I just said, will direct more people in the right direction than almost anything else. You should leave the gym feeling good, okay? Here's the other side of that. Here's another point. If you do that and you do it right and you're starting to see results, even if they're slow, but you feel good and you kind of enjoy going, what are we doing? We're developing a relationship with exercise that you're gonna wanna maintain. You're gonna wanna continue to go. We got to think of this in those terms. We can't think of uh, workouts in the terms of, I can survive this for the next few months and then I'll figure it out afterwards. Like if you dread going, if you hate it, if you leave and, and you're sore and you can't move and that self-hate eventually goes away and you just feel like crap and you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like you're done. You're not going to go anymore. And then you rebel, by the way. This is what happens is that people, um, you'll talk to people and they'll, and they'll say things like, um, you know, hey, how's your workout going? Oh, I stopped. You know, I just, I just want to enjoy my life. Mm. Like what? What do you mean you want to enjoy your life? The proper application of exercise and nutrition, there's almost nothing that will improve every facet of your life, literally, like simply becoming more fit and healthy in the real way, in, in the appropriate way. Nothing. Think of anything, right? Your, your ability to parent your kids or be a partner or or work or sleep, um, connect with others. Like if you're more fit and healthy, everything gets better. And yet people say, I'm, I stopped because I wanna enjoy my life. Well, mm. well, you were doing it wrong. You were definitely doing it wrong. If you've never been to a gym, um, it can be intimidating. Like I said, I've, I've run gyms, I've owned gyms, uh, you know, for two and a half decades. And I will, this is 100% true. Anybody who works out regularly or who owns a gym or works in a gym will tell you this. It's the most accepting place you'll ever go in your entire life. If you go in there and work out, 
you could be surrounded by the most hardcore athletes, bodybuilders, powerlifters, scary looking people, you know, grunting and yelling. They are so accepting. You, you tap them on the shoulder. Hey, can you, oh yeah, absolutely. Let me help you out. Let me show you. It is an incredible place because everybody there either started where you were or they just respect the work because they do it themselves. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing environment. And I have to say that because I've seen articles recently that try to paint gyms as these uh, unaccepting, intolerant, place. In fact, my friend, my good friend, Father Steve, who's a, he's a priest. He's uh he runs the production for Bishop Barron and he also works out. And he told me, he goes, the church has a lot to learn from gyms. He goes, man, I go in there. He goes, they don't care what you look like, where you come from, what, who you pray to. It's like, they're so accepting because we're all here trying to better ourselves. So I want to say that to encourage people. It seems intimidating. Trust me, go in there and you'll see it's, 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 and by the way, the most accepting ones are the most hardcore gyms, which you wouldn't think the ones that seem the most scary. So, all right. So yes, it's incredibly protective. It's incredibly healthy. It's incredibly good for you, but here's uh, kind of how I want to hammer that home. Your body will only ever be as strong and as fit and as healthy as it thinks it needs to be. Our bodies evolved to be incredibly efficient with energy. For most of human history, food was scarce. So one of the primary drivers of evolution for humans was how do we survive in scarcity? How do we survive around the scarcity? And one of the, the, the side effects or effects of that was if we don't use it, we lose it. That's an old saying in fitness, right? So here's this energy expensive tissue called muscle. We're only going to keep it if we need it. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Like, why would I have a V10, you know, six liter engine truck if I only need to cruise at 25 miles an hour all day long and haul nothing? Like, that's wasting gas, essentially, is what your body's saying. So it will only keep you as strong as you need to be, and it will continue to adapt in that direction if that's what you present it with. So if, as you get older, you become less and less active, your body's going to continue to meet that and adapt that way. So this is why, ask any, any doctor in the field, you take a patient who's having trouble walking, you put, they know if they put them on a walker, they're going to, they're, they're going to decline even faster. You take someone who is having strength and mobility issues, they sit down more, their health is going to decline even faster. They know this. Doctors will tell you this. Like we only, and this is relatively recent. They'll say, we'll have you use a walker if necessary, but we would prefer you strengthen your body to try to not to use them because we know your body will shape and mold it and adapt to that walker. And that's what ends up happening. So you have to give your body a reason to maintain vitality and strength and mobility. And if you're not doing that, your body will adapt in that way. And look, for anybody who's ever had a cast on a, on a, on a body part, you ever break a leg or an arm and have a cast on it? What does that arm or leg look like when you take it off 30 days later? That muscle is gone. I don't care how old you are. You take. I remember when I had. I dislocated my knee as a kid. Took the cast off, and I freaked out when I looked at my leg because it was like the muscle was gone. Luckily, it came back because I was you know moving and active. But your body will adapt. So if you tell your body, we don't need mobility, we don't need strength, I don't need vitality, I don't need lots of cognitive function, it's going to start to decline. By the way, we separate the the brain and the mind from the body, but it's the body. Mm -hmm. Your brain is in your body. Your mind is a result of lots of different things, but one of them is a healthy brain. If you allow your body to become unhealthy, your brain becomes unhealthy. It's a part of your body. It's all the same. So look at the connection between dementia and diabetes, obesity, mobility issues, very strong connection, very strong connection. So you want to keep a sharp mind, keep a healthy brain, keep a healthy body. It's really that simple. Now, I, I do also want to say, because my space communicates this terribly, you don't need to beat the crap out of yourself. You don't need to be, by the way, top athletes don't even work like this, work out like this all the time. The problem is we look at social media or, you know, when I was a kid, look at magazines, nobody's going to highlight their normal workouts. You know, when I post my workouts, even on social media, I'm not showing you how I normally work out. I'm going to post my PRs, right? The, the, the ones I want to show off on. That's not how I work out all the time. The way you should train 80 to 90% of the time is cruising. There's that 10% of the time where you're pushing. That's about it. Even pro athletes train that way. They have an in-season and they have an off-season. 
So when you go train yourself, train yourself appropriately. Most of your workouts should make you feel good, not like you beat the crap out of yourself. So if you're watching, listening to this, you're like, God, last time I tried to work out, I couldn't walk for three days, or I took that class and I almost threw up. Not appropriate. You should feel more energized after your workout. You should, you should feel some challenge, but it should be appropriate to your current fitness level. So if you're doing nothing now, just do a little more than you're doing now, and that's enough to elicit change. If you get super fit, well, yeah, your workouts are going to have to be much harder to elicit any further change, but it needs to be appropriate. Too much is not only not appropriate, not only will it not get you there faster, but it, it might even reverse your progress. So there's a myth, you know, if I work out harder, I get results faster. No, if you work out too hard, you won't get there at all. Yeah. You see so many people feel like if I do not leave the workout dripping in sweat, I didn't achieve silly anything. Terrible, terrible. And we, and we promote that, right? You go on, you, you look at fitness gurus and influencers, and they make you think that every workout is like one that you need to survive. Um, no, no, that's crazy. If I trained my clients like that, I would have had no success as a trainer, both with clients that got great results and were able to maintain them forever. And just as a business person, it, look, any trainer watching this right now, if you're a trainer or coach, and you beat the crap out of your clients all the time, you're not going to last. I promise you. You're going to have clients who are going to drop like flies. Most workouts need to make you feel good. So you should leave the workout feeling better than you did walking into it, not feeling like you just survived. That's a 100% fact, and I'll stand by that all day long. And every good trainer and coach will back me up. Are there any other core principles like that? You know, you chatted about that a little bit last time, but just while we're on this topic, other things that you think are sort of key mistakes when people say, okay, listen, I know I want to prioritize fitness to build muscle. Muscle has all these protective elements, yeah. which you've talked about, including deeply linked to longevity, cancer protection, et cetera, et cetera. Other couple of handful of mistakes that you feel that people are making once they go down that route. So the first one was use you if either, either you use it or you lose it, yes. right? So just so many people don't even start because they're intimidated and they're like, oh, it's too late. I wish I started my right. 40s and people were 40. I wish I started my 20s and you know, so on and so forth. Second one was, you know, not thinking that a good or a successful workout is you beating yourself up every single time and being completely dead, right? I think a lot of fitness classes also uh they become popular, especially in cities like LA or San Francisco yeah. or other places, because people are like, oh my gosh, that workout killed me. <laughs> right. That was like a killer workout. And it's like a challenging thing for all their friends to, you know, do together. Any other handful of things you'd add into that? Yeah. So let me first let me cover that. That shared suffering uh can definitely it can feel cathartic when the reason you're working out is because you hate the way you look and you hate yourself. So that's why it feels so good, by the way. So someone watching right now is like, I love those workouts that make me feel like I'm gonna throw up. Probably because you looked in the mirror and said to yourself, I hate myself. Wow. I'm gross, I'm unattractive, I'm not sexy. So that painful beat yourself up workout was cathartic. But I'm going to tell you something right now. Keep that up long enough and you'll hate it and you'll rebel. And the rebellion is going to look like you're not going to work out at all. Same thing with diet. If you diet because you hate yourself, uh, then diet becomes restrictive and it becomes a punishment. And at first it feels good. I don't deserve to eat that. I eat like crap all the time. I'm going to eat this way. Well, at some point you'll rebel. And you know what it looks like? It doesn't look like you go off your diet a little bit. It looks like you go way off your diet. You ever, If you track how people who approach diet that way, what it looks like when they go off, they don't eat one cookie. They eat a box of cookies and they feel terrible afterwards. So it's literally rebellion against that hating yourself model. So number one, work out because you love yourself, because you deserve to be healthy. You deserve to be cared for. Go to your go to the gym or do your exercise or eat because you want to care for yourself, and that'll lead you uh, in uh, the right direction. Okay, here's here's something that will probably blow people's minds, but it's 100 percent true, and I'll I'll make the case. It's more effective to work out a little bit every day than it is to work out a lot a couple days a week, even if the even if everything's controlled, everything's the same. It's more effective, and here's number one reason why. Habits are better formed when we do them regularly versus when we do them sporadically. Our bodies also adapt better that way. And all growth is a form of adaptation. Even learning is a form of adaptation. So if I ask you, if I, if I had you learn 
a language and you went to one class that was seven hours long once a week versus you did one hour a day, which one do you think would impact you more positively? Yeah, right? one hour a day. That's right. So if you really you want to really hack this, this is what you do. Get a pair of dumbbells or some resistance bands. Keep them in your house or maybe a suspension trainer. That's also pretty versatile. And instead of going to the gym twice a week for 45 minutes a day or whatever, do 10 to 15 minutes a day, every day. Go do two exercises. That's it. Two. Today I'm going to do squats and I'm going to do some push-ups. Tomorrow I'm going to do overhead press and I'm going to do some deadlifts. The next thing I'm going to do some crunches and I'm going to do some hip thrusts. That's it. 10 to 15 minutes a day. It's more effective psychologically. It'll develop, the behaviors will develop faster. It'll feel more like a, um, like a habit and you're, it is going to solidify faster. It's more convenient. The, all the busy people, the executives, the people who are really, truly like working crazy hours, it's easier for them to find 15 minutes a day than it is for them to find an hour twice a week. That's just a fact. People are at home with their kids. Same thing. You tell a mom or dad who's at home with the kids. Can you make time to go to the gym two or three days a week for an hour? I'm like, oh, I got to go plan this out. Maybe find a babysitter. But if I say to him, hey, can you do like 10, 15 minutes a day? Oh, yeah, I could do that. I could totally do that. So it's it's far easier to stay consistent. Also, the data suggests that the body adapts better that way as well. That the body actually adapts better with small doses than they do to less frequent, larger doses when it comes to strength training in particular. Fatigue is a strength training. Uh, it counters a lot of the benefits of strength training. Uh, and that's why you do sets, by the way. This is why people who, who, when you do strength training properly, you do a set and you rest. When fatigue sets in, it stops becoming strength training. It becomes more cardiovascular training. So that might be another uh, reason why. Um, so yeah, try that out. So literally two exercises a day, 10 to 15 minutes. Keep the intensity moderate. Watch what happens to your body. You'll be blown away. It, it, will, it will literally trip you out. And it also feels better because 10 to 15 minutes feels invigorating. 45 minutes can sometimes feel a little bit like too much work. So when I turned 40, which was last year, I got serious about strength training, building muscle mass, and started making it a regular part of my routine and was very consistent for like nine months. Took a little tiny break this summer, traveling, other things like that. I was working out three to four days a week, feel so much more confident in the gym, body composition, totally transformed and put on about, you know, almost about nine pounds of lean muscle mass wow. in the process and dropped a bunch of, uh, of, uh, body fat percentage as well. So now I'm at a different place than when I was starting. So I want to kind of go through a few different cohorts of people. So okay. for that person that is literally like, okay, yes, I know I, I saw you the first time on the podcast. I've been watching your content. I, yeah, I like the idea of, you know, 10 to 15 minutes every day. I got the dumbbells. What's the best way for them to put or follow some sort of program? Because you hear them, yeah. you hear individuals saying, I literally don't even know what to do. Yeah. Right. So are there self-guided things? Do you recommend that they follow stuff on YouTube? Have you guys at Mind Pump put together sort of introductory programs for people? Yeah. So we, we put it, we, we have a program called MAPS 15, which is 15 minutes a day. And it uses a suspension trainer to keep it convenient. There is an advanced version that uses uh, free weights as well for people who like. What's uh, a suspension weights. trainer? Suspension trainer, like a TRX. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So you literally, you could, I mean, I mean, God, they're now you can get them on Amazon for like, I think 50 bucks and you can hook it over your door or something stable. And then you have, and they're the thing about suspension trainers that are really cool is they're um, appropriate for beginners all the way to advance. Cause you change the angle and it can make, I can make a push up super, super uh, beginner, or I can make it very advanced for somebody who's really strong just simply by changing the angle um, of the handle. So they're super appropriate, very convenient. So you could follow a program like maps 15, uh, very easy, convenient. If you don't want to invest in a program, you want to kind of try it out literally pick one to two exercises, uh, and just practice those and try to change them up each time you work out. The best exercises to pick from, from are some type of a squatting movement. There's lots of variations of squats. Okay. But some type of a squatting movement, some type of a horizontal pressing movement, a push up, a bench press, a dumbbell press, a band press, something like that. Some type of an overhead or vertical pressing movement. So like an overhead 
dumbbell press or with bands or something like that. Some type of a pulling movement, a row would be a great example. There's lots of variations of different kinds of rows. Um, and something that involves stabilization of the core or something with rotation. So like a plank or a crunch or a, what's called a chop with a band. Um, and, and that's it. And there's lots of variations of those. And so you could pick from those five or six movements, pick two of them, do them on that on Monday, pick another two, do that on Tuesday, pick another two, do them on Wednesday and just kind of cycle through. Now maps 15 is much more meticulously programmed and does make a difference. But if you're just getting started, you'll do fine by just doing what I said, where you just pick a, a couple exercises. It really isn't uh, that crazy. And then focus on technique. So you are doing skills. So don't think that the, uh, that the end is, uh, you know, I need to have sore legs or I need to feel a burn in this muscle. Don't think of it that way. Uh, imagine you're practicing uh, a sport. So I'm telling you to free throw in one day and I'm telling you to throw a, you know, three pointer on another day. I'm, th I'm telling you to dribble. If I were telling you to practice the dribble, you wouldn't just dribble until you were fatigued. You would practice the technique. So treat this like techniques. Okay. So Sal said per, a squat, I'm going to do a body weight squat. Don't just do them until you're tired. Watch yourself in the mirror, pull up a video on YouTube. We have mind pump TV. We have every exercise I just listed is on there. You can watch us teach it and then practice and perfect that movement work within your capability. So if you go too low and it hurts, that's okay. Don't go that low then. And then each time you practice, see if you can go a little lower. Okay. Practice and perfect the technique that what I just said right now will, will guide most people for a while before they need any further, um, type of programming. Yeah. Like literally people could probably do that for at least six months or a year. Totally. And not only see results, but feel more confident to get to like the next level. Oh, oh, they, they'll see great results within that period. Like great results. You'll, you'll get stronger, especially in the first year, your mobility connection, um, control and strength will improve almost weekly for probably the first year. If you just did that. So every week you'll notice like, Oh, that feels easier. Wow. I did another rep. Oh, I could go a little lower. Wow. That feels really good. So barring any injury or anything like that. Yeah. You'll, you'll see progress. They call them newbie gains in the, in the fitness world. <laughs> so that's 10 to 15 minutes every day. That's it. Right. Yep. Seven days a week. That's yeah. I, I set six or seven is perfectly fine. Yeah. I like seven just cause it keeps the momentum. It's if you don't beat yourself up and you do what I just said, it'll be appropriate for most people. Cause you'll self gauge the intensity based on your fitness level. I personally like to start the day that way. Uh, less things get in the way. So it's like, wake up and do them. Um, but any time of the day is perfectly fine. You touched on this last time, but you are a big fan of making sure that, especially if you can starting off your morning with protein. Yeah. Do you want to habit stack that along with these sort of newbie gains yeah. that somebody might be getting from I love practicing you, some of these resistance? I love what you just said about habit stacking. Habit stacking is uh, a behavioral approach to um, trying to implement a new skill or behavior. And what you do is you attach it to something that you already do. So if I said, um, you know, uh, I want you to walk for 30 minutes a day versus walk for 10 minutes after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, what you'll find is people will be more consistent if they do it with breakfast, lunch, if they attach it to the thing that they already do. Okay. So if you need to do that, that's great. So if you do the two exercises and you're like, you know, I think I, it's better off if I do one exercise after breakfast and one after lunch. Okay. Perfectly fine. Really. There's no, there's, I don't care how you put it together. Um, it doesn't make a difference, but habit stacking is a phenomenal way to do it. Attaching it to waking up and making it part of your morning routine is just another way uh, of doing that. You could do it before bed too. I just find that to be more challenging for people typically. So if they wanted to incorporate the protein aspect of it, you know, what do you tell your, your clients? Now we're kind of combining dietary interventions yeah. to improve satiety, which is a big part yeah. of what you were talking about last time, higher protein diets, what they have impact on. So a lot of people are not used to sort of, or have questions about like, wow, like, you know, how do I mentally sort of wrap my head around sort of starting to include more protein yeah. in my diet? Yeah, yeah. So, um, if you do this in the morning, you're probably better off eating afterwards. I know that people will say eat before or whatever, and there's personal preference here, but I would eat afterwards. Um, and what they find, the data shows that when people exercise and 
uh, regularly, they're more likely to make better food choices. I think it's just you're in that same mentality. But yeah, back to the protein. Starting your day off with protein has been shown to reduce cravings um, and control blood sugar throughout the day better, regardless of what else you eat. So if everything's the same, but this person eats more of their protein in the morning, this person doesn't, you're less likely to have cravings, energy crashes, irritability, all the things associated with blood sugar spikes and drops. Also, eating a high, when I mentioned high protein diet, I should have gone into the details. High protein, the way I define it, or the way that the data defines it, is about a gram of protein per pound of target body weight. So take whatever your target body weight is, aim for that in grams of protein. That's not easy to do. So I want people to know protein is very satiety producing. So if you're a 130 pound female, and let's say your target body weight is 120 pounds, eating 120 grams of protein, you'll find is, is going to really crush your appetite. Um, so you want to eat a good amount of it in the morning. Otherwise you play, you're, you're behind the eight ball. So 120 grams of protein, divide that by three meals. You have your, you know, your 40 grams of protein or whatever for breakfast, eat that first. If you don't, you'll find it's going to be really challenging throughout the day. Protein shakes can be helpful at, you know, meeting those needs. But I always encourage people to get this through whole natural foods. By the way, protein shakes are processed food. So, you know, all the, the health food categories of processed foods are still processed foods. In fact, the top selling health foods are the ones that taste the best. And that'll tell you a lot about, about that market. Yeah. Number one seller at uh, whole foods in the uh, food section is pizza. <laughs> yeah, of course. Right, right, right. Or the best tasting protein shake, right? Yeah. Uh, so let's say somebody's been doing that, whether it's that program, they've been doing that for about a year, they've started to notice these gains and, or they've been doing something on their own, mm -hmm. something similarly. And they're like, you know what? I want to now kick it up a notch. And it's a journey and a lifestyle that I want to embark to really sort of get into the best shape of my life. Mm -hmm. Not from a standpoint of like, oh, I want like six pack abs or I want this, but I want to feel strong yeah. and I want to continue to feel strong as I age, but also maintain the mobility, flexibility, mm -hmm. et cetera. You know, what kind of program should that person be thinking about now to be embarking on? If this, um, the MAPS 15, which we have the link into the show notes, people can check it out on the Mind Pump website. What kind of program should that individual be looking at? And do they need to be thinking about working with like a personal trainer? Yeah. So, oh, okay. I'm glad you said that. A good trainer or coach is worth their weight in gold. Okay. Because uh, fitness and nutrition are, especially nutrition, they can be very challenging things to change and implement and keep on a consistent basis. And a good trainer or coach isn't just somebody that has knowledge on exercise and diet, but they're also really good guides. They're going to guide you on this journey. And a good coach or trainer's goal is to get you to be able to do this on your own for the rest of your life. Okay. So when you hire somebody that's really good, the success rates with really good trainers and coaches is the best period. End of story. So, and you don't need to work with them all the time. You could do like once a week or, you know, twice a month. Um, obviously if you worked with them every time you worked out even better, but they're worth their weight in gold. So I highly suggest finding someone who's good, hiring them. They'll be able to coach you, um, through this process. Okay. So let's say you start with the 15 minutes a day. There's so much you can do within that 15 minutes before you have to move to anything more advanced that you'll be okay for a long time. So like, for example, um, increase the amount of reps that can happen for a while, right? Increase the load. Well, I went from body weight squats to higher rep body weight squats, to holding dumbbells for body weight squats, to putting a barbell on my back with body weight squats, and then adding more weight to the bar. Like we could go a long way with just that, right? It could be, I could only squat down this deep. Now I'm squatting on this deep. Now I can go down all the way. Now, so the, the ways you could advance your workouts within the context of what I just said, you could take that for years before you do anything else, like add more exercises or add more frequency or anything like that. So, and I want to be very clear with that because I think people, they'll do something like that be like, okay, I'm ready. And they think that the next step is some crazy progression into something else. It's, it's, you could go, I, I trained people for years, uh, where they would start with me two days a week and we would work out for five years progressing with that before I moved them to three days a week. So it's not as crazy as you think. And what you'll find is the, if you do this right 
and you work with your body, the progressions are not going to be that hard to figure out. Literally, you'll be like, hmm, I did 10. I think I could do 12. Now I did 12. Now I think I could do 14. Now I'm going to hold the dumbbell. Now I'm going to do it a little faster or whatever, or slower or pause at the bottom just to increase or, you know, make the challenge more. But, you know, we have, I think we offer now something like 17 or 18 different programs that you could choose from. Um, a trainer will help put one together for you. That's individualized. Nothing will beat that. So people can sign up online and they have like a, like a virtual consultation with a trainer yeah. or is it? No. So we just sell programs, sell programs. Yeah. So you can and, just and go we, on there, oh, yeah. buy have, a program. Yeah. And even yeah. in maps 15, there's, so with the suspension trainer, you could progress the suspension trainer to make it more and more challenging. Look, I'm going to give you an example. Okay. So we created maps 15, uh, partially because we saw a need for people who just have a tough time carving out 45 minutes or an hour to go to the gym. Also the data on frequency when all other controls are taken care of, uh, showed that it was more effective. You look, you see this with, uh, like Olympic lifters. They're, they're practicing exercises super frequently versus doing one long, super hard, uh, type of workout. I also experimented with this myself. When we created maps 15, I did a more advanced version where I would spend about 25 minutes and I use barbells and dumbbells, but still 25 minutes a day. Okay. And, uh, I hit, I posted it on my, my, uh, social media at 43 years old. I hit a PR and deadlift, like stronger than I was in my early thirties when I hit it, the previous PR. So there's a lot you could do with, with what I just said. Um, and it's funny cause we created that program. We have advanced people following it and they're like, uh, I didn't think I'd get better results than I did what I was doing before, but I must've been doing too much and I'm getting, you know, far better results. So, um, think about it this way. If, if I told you to dig a hole as fast as you could, you could use a spoon and work real hard, but you'd probably be smarter if you got a shovel or got a backhoe to the work for you. So a good workout is just that it's effective. A good workout isn't necessarily the harder one or the longer one. So let's talk about the diet side, remind yep. us again about the protein and then walk us through any other dietary principles that are part of your world. Yeah. So if you look at studies, so we'll start at the top here. Okay. Like big picture. If you look at studies where they take obese individuals and have them see a dietitian or a nutritionist or someone who gives them a diet, and you compare them to obese individuals who see a therapist, okay, the people who see a therapist have a better success rate than the people who go and see a dietitian or a nutritionist. Wow. Okay. What does that tell us? That tells us that we're focusing far too much on the ones and zeros, like I said before, the program, you know, eat this, eat that, don't eat this, don't eat that. And less on the why, why am I doing this? Why am I driven this way? Why am I reaching for these things? Why is it so hard for me? Okay. And that's the thing that we need to start with. So let's start big picture first, but then I'll, I'll kind of zero in because it gets a little esoteric at first. So first off, we all have a relationship with food. Uh, and our relationship has been developed through uh, society, how we grew up, um, how we connect to food during different you know, times, whether we're stressed or angry or sad or happy or whatever. Um, some foods mean certain things to us, other foods mean other things to us. Here's a silly example that's funny, right? Um, if I were to label, if I were to tell you to list five breakfast foods and five dinner foods, I bet you, know, you took 100 people, they would be very similar, right? How did that happen? Why are there, why are eggs and bacon a breakfast food or why is cereal a breakfast food, right? Why is like steak and potato a dinner food? Well, because we developed that relationship and largely through marketing that told us that some foods are something and other foods are other things, right? Um, if I say popcorn, when do you eat popcorn? Ah, that's when I go to the movies, right? Um, so this is something that we need to become uh, a bit aware of. Most of us have developed a relationship with food that revolves around palatability. Palatability is the top thing that we use to develop a relationship with food, okay? Is how palatable something is. In fact, most people watching this right now have probably never even felt what it feels like to be hungry. I know people are like, what are you talking about? I get hungry every day at noon or whatever. Not really. Uh, hunger doesn't set in until about 48 hours of fasting. That's when you start to feel anybody who's ever fasted for who's done like a spiritual fast where they go for, you know, 48 or 72 hours will tell you, Oh, it's, it feels very different to feel hungry. Um, 
So we don't know what that feels like. We know what it feels like to eat things that taste good, make us feel good. And that's kind of about it. Uh, most of us don't even know that certain foods make us feel other ways. Like I used to get clients who would tell me that they would take antacids um, every day at noon because they just, oh, I just get heartburn. It's just something that I have. And then eventually we realize like, well, it's the bagel that you eat every morning. They never connected the two. Mm. They had no idea that it was that that caused that. Okay. So our relationship to food is extremely important. And I'll start with this because that's a complex one, but I'll start with this. Are you trying to eat healthier or better because you hate yourself or are you doing it because you love yourself? Mm. Okay. Um, most of us do it because we hate ourselves. I hate the way I look. I hate the way I feel. I'm inadequate. I'm lazy and whatever. Uh, so I'm going to change how I eat. If you go into changing your diet from that standpoint, food becomes restrictive. Food becomes a reward. It becomes a punishment. It's not enjoyable to eat quote unquote unhealthy. It's tyrannical. It's what I do to me because I hate me and I'm bad and I'm don't have discipline or whatever. And so this is how I'm going to eat now. So here's a clue to that, by the way, you'll, you, if somebody's on a diet and you offer them, let's say a food that's not on their diet, like, Hey, you want a cookie? They'll respond with, no, I can't. No, no, I can't. I'm on a diet right now. Or no, I can't. Like, what do you mean you can't? Of course you can. You don't want to, or you want to. It's very different, right? Now let's define what I, what I said about love, self-love. It's not a feeling. Um, I say that because people are like, what do you mean love myself? I don't always love my, of course you don't. It's, but it's an action. If you think of it as an action, that's really what love is, right? Like I have kids. I don't always like my kids, but I always love them. Mm. I, I try to do what's best for them. Um, so think in terms of eating healthy from the standpoint of you're trying to care for yourself. Start there. It's very important because then eating healthy doesn't feel restrictive. It doesn't feel like a punishment. It feels like self-care. That's so important. Okay. I can't stress this enough. If you don't start from that standpoint, this is always going to feel tyrannical. This is always going to feel um, like you're white knuckling it. And at some point you will rebel and rebellion against tyranny is, looks like this binging or going way off. Like people don't go off their diet by eating a slice of pizza. Nobody goes off their diet by eating one slice of pizza. Everybody goes off their diet by eating so much pizza they're uncomfortable and they're sick on the couch. Like what just happened, right? So start with the standpoint of, okay, I want to care for myself. I want to, I want to eat in a way that, that cares for me. So let's start there first. And just to pause you there, if somebody's listening and is like, you know what? I want that. And I also know I'm not there and I need that. Then is that where you're saying, hey, maybe we find a therapist first. Let's find some support around you to help you get there. If you genuinely feel that you're stuck and you can't get there alone, like you're so spiraling downward or you just have so much self-loathing or maybe you're stuck in depression mm -hmm. and you don't know how to get out, is that where you would say, okay, let's find a therapist to help you so that you can actually at least start to step into some elements of self-love. Yeah, my my the greatest success I had with clients were when uh, it was me and they had a therapist at the same time. It was all the success rate went through the roof when both they had both of us working with them. The physical and the mental. Uh, it was just it was like, oh, this person's going to I mean, we've done so many episodes about tackling depression yeah. through movement, through improving blood sugar, through metabolic health, et cetera. So I 100% believe yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, let's say, okay, I don't want to go that route. Just start with what I'm saying. Okay, I want to care for myself. Now, I do want to be clear. Uh, palatability and the enjoyment of eating is also a value. So I'm not saying it's not a value, okay? I'm just saying it's not the only value. So what's happening is we're basing our decisions off of one one value, one true understanding. It's like picking a partner to marry based off of looks and looks alone. Could you imagine the disaster? Well, I know. I mean, a lot of people have that disaster, right? Where it's <laughs> just looks. You don't care about anything else. It's just about how attractive they are, right? That's obviously going to cause a problem. So palatability, yes, there's value there. But there's other values that we haven't learned to either develop or even acknowledge that we need to pay attention to, okay? So... How does this food make me feel energy wise? When do I reach for this food? Um, how does it affect my digestion, my skin, 
By the way, you're going to have to pay attention to these things at first before they start to become automatic because most of us are not even aware that these foods affect us in particular ways. How does it affect my sleep? How do I feel while I eat it? So start paying attention to those types of things as well. And then let's do this. Let's look at food and let's realize that one of the biggest challenges we have with eating properly is it's really hard not to overeat. It's just really hard not to overeat. Okay, now I'm going to add something to that. When we eat foods that are designed and engineered to make us overeat, it's actually not normal or should I say not typical or common to overeat when you eat foods that are not designed to do that. A lot of people don't realize that. There's this myth that humans are eating machines. If you just put food in front of us, we'll eat until we're all obese and sick. That's not true. We have natural systems of satiety that we evolved with that tell us when it's time to stop eating. Overeating 5,000 years ago had its own risk. Now it's probably not obesity because it's probably real hard to be obese, but if you overate to the point of gastric distress or issues, that meant death. Okay. Mm. So we have natural systems of satiety that we've hijacked because food scientists have done an incredible job at designing foods that overcome that. And we have studies now, some of the best studies in nutrition that exist are some of the studies I'm about to talk about in terms of how foods affect these systems of satiety. So they have got studies now where, and I, and I say these are some of the best studies because the studies on nutrition, a lot of them can be quite cloudy because they require uh, self-reporting mm. and they're not controlled well. And gosh, you tell somebody, you know, did you, how many tomatoes did you eat over the last month? It's like, okay, I don't know, you know, five or whatever. But if you could put people in a lab and watch them and count what they're eating, now we're getting a better, more accurate picture. Well, they've done studies where they take groups of people, they put them in a lab, and this group over here has unlimited access to heavily processed foods. These are engineered foods, okay? Mm. Heavily processed foods. And then this group over here has unlimited access to whole natural foods, foods that, you know, or maybe one ingredient, apples, bananas, nuts, meat, that kind of stuff, eggs, right? So heavily processed foods, whole natural foods. Then they watch them. By the way, they also, for people who, who are like, oh, it's the macro, no, no, no. They also have similar macro breakdowns. They actually did a pretty good job with this. It wasn't like they all had all sugar over here. Sure. It was a pretty similar breakdown. They watched them and observed. Then they took those groups, and I love this, they switched rooms, okay? So who knows? Maybe this group over here just eats more than this one. No, no, they switched rooms. And they've done several studies like this. Here's what they found. On average, people e eating heavily processed foods will eat daily 600 more calories a day. Wow. On average. That's a lot. That's like two and a half hours of running for the average person on a treadmill to burn 600 calories, okay? Why is that? Heavily processed foods... They're not inherently unhealthy, although most of them are. Uh, they're not inherently evil or anything like that. It's just the vast majority of research and development that went into those foods, the vast majority of money and production that went into those foods went into making them hyper palatable, okay? If you ever talk to a food scientist, they'll explain this to you. Like they've got it down to the point. Like they know the right combination of salty, sweet, texture, sound it makes when you crunch on it, residue that it leaves on your fingers, the sound the bag makes when you open it, the color on the bag, like all of that, that'll make you eat more than you would if it had, let's say, a different combination. Uh, I had Chris Kresser on the show years ago. He's a phenomenal example. He said, if I gave you five plain boiled potatoes, plain. And I told you to eat them all. And in 30 minutes, would you be able to? And I was like, well, I don't know. I'd probably gag. And he says, well, if I gave you a family size bag of potato chips, would you be able to do it? And I said, yeah. And he goes, same, same amount of potatoes. Wow. That's how palatable potato chips are in comparison to the potato. So why am I saying this? If you're going to try and do what I'm saying, it's going to be really hard if you're eating foods that have been engineered and you know billions of dollars over decades have been spent on making you overeat them, good luck. 
So would you also put into that category, not as bad, but they're, you know, if you go to like Whole Foods, still one of the top sellers is like potato chips. Yeah. They might be fried in avocado oil, but there's still potato chips yeah. at the end of the day. So there's even still a lot of quote unquote health food that has sort of picked up. And now a lot of these health companies are being sold to bigger companies and they're getting, you know, all the same things. And also people are just inherently, they know that, wow, if you add a little bit more tapioca syrup to these gummies, even though if they have vitamin D in them, just people are going to keep on eating them because they're like super sweet and they're fun to eat. So also in this category, not to just throw like the big food under the bus is a lot of sort of, you know, heavily processed quote unquote health. You you hit the nail on the head. Okay. Look, um, markets, right. We live in a market-based society, uh, and there's wonderful, um, benefits to living in a market-based society, but markets do something exceptionally well. They give us what we want. They don't give us what we need. They give us what we want, okay? The top selling health foods, the top selling protein bars are not the ones that are the healthiest. They're the ones that taste the best, okay? That's it, fact. If you, and I know this is my space, I'm in the fitness space. If I wanna make a protein powder or a protein bar or a healthy snack, the way that I'm gonna sell the most of that product is by making it taste the best, okay? By making it the most palatable. Okay, so you hit the nail on the head. Heavily processed foods are designed to make you overeat. Okay, period, end of story. If they comprise a majority of your diet, good luck trying to eat the appropriate amount. This is how powerful it is. One of my favorite things to do with clients, I love doing this, and I challenge anybody watching this to try this right now. I would do this right here. I'd say, I don't want you to eat any less. Here's what I want you to do. Don't eat heavily processed foods. Just eat whole natural foods. Eat as much as you want. Let's just start there. And everybody would look at me like, what do you mean as much as I want? I don't care. Eat as much steak, rice, potatoes, fish, eggs, fruit. Eat as much as you want. All of it. Eat as much as you want. And uh, let's just start there. Then they'd come see, and then, you know, we would track their, their, their progress or whatever. And, you know, within a couple months, I'd be like, wow, you lost seven pounds of body fat. And they'd look at me like I was crazy. Wow. Oh my God. I'm like full. I'm like eating until I'm full every single day. And they think that there was some weird chemical in the heavily processed food that would make him gain body fat and all that stuff. And they'd say, no, you're eating less calories. And then I'd have them track. And then sure enough, they were eating, you know, five, six, seven hundred less calories a day because they were eating foods that your body is aligned with. When you eat whole natural foods, your, your, your satiety will kick in when it's supposed to, unlike heavily processed foods that it's like a lag. Okay. So that's one thing right there. Protein is another one. Protein is very, very satiety inducing. If you eat your body weight in grams of protein and for people who are overweight, use your target body weight. You know, I, I, I weigh uh, about 210 pounds. Eating 210 pounds, uh, grams, excuse me, 210 grams of protein per day from whole natural foods is hard. I know I do this every single day. (laughs) It's, it really, it's like, oh my God, I am like full and I'm at 160 grams of protein. Like this is really tough. If you're a 110 pound female, 150 pound female, 170 pound male, try it. Try doing it for five days in a row. Prioritize it because it's going to be hard otherwise and, and watch what happens. It is satiety inducing like none other. We have all the data and studies to support this. Do this from whole natural foods, not protein powders. Protein powders are a hack that kind of make it easier, okay? Great for people who are, you know, bodybuilders, but the average person, I'd say only use protein powders. Even if, like a grass-fed whey, you know, that doesn't have a lot of fillers and stuff inside of it. Here's how you should use protein powders. If you don't hit your protein target at the end of the day, go ahead and throw in a, okay, a protein powder. It. But so it's a supplemental, but it shouldn't be the base. No, because one of the benefits of, of, of protein is it, it produces satiety. Drinking a 30 gram protein shake from whey isn't going to produce satiety like eating 30 grams of protein from chicken. Sure. Just, it just doesn't. Sure. Even if you take out the other, the fat or whatever from the chicken, it just doesn't. So avoid heavily processed foods. Eat your body weight in grams of protein or aim for that and prioritize that. Okay. That's, that's the other one. Um, also eat, uh, you know, well-cooked vegetables. That's another thing, but really everything else is, is splitting hairs or small potatoes, I should say, in comparison to what I just said, literally, literally the average client will lose 10 to 15 pounds 
just by avoiding heavily processed foods and eating as much whole foods as they want. It was like yeah. clockwork. I would get them to lose 10 pounds and they feel like they were eating so much food. They were so stuffed. And I loved it because it made me look like a wizard, like, a, like I was some like magical trainer. But then I would break it down and explain to them. Um, another one is to drink uh, a lot of water. It, it's funny. Um, in the hardcore muscle building space, there's a lot of what they would call bro science. Okay. So you make fun of it online. Like, oh, that's bro science. Some of it is rooted in some truth. They just didn't know how to explain it. The way they would explain it was bro science. But the results... Were, were real. It still worked. It's just like yeah, the explanation may not be accurate. Yeah. <laughs> so here's a good one. Um, drink a half a gallon to a gallon of water every day. Uh, that you'll, you'll notice some weight loss effects from doing that. Okay. What's happening? Is the water flushing fat out of my body? Is it? No, no, it's not doing any of that. You drink that much water. You're not drinking anything else. That's the bottom line. You just end up drinking just water. And water itself kind of makes you feel full sometimes. Kind of helps you make, feel full, slightly being dehydrated or not optimizing your water intake tends to make you want to eat more. When I would get clients to do that as well, we would also notice some weight loss um, from doing that. So these are just small things that I like to say because they're effective in their sustainability. And I love things that make people feel like they're not doing a lot. Like, okay, I'm just doing this, but what the heck is going on? Versus, you know, when people follow diet diets, it's like this, uh, this really hard thing I got to try and do every single day. I mean, those, those things right there that I just listed, um, make a huge impact. Oh, here's one other thing. Um, you want to cut your calories by 10 to 15% every day. This is really easy. Okay. When you eat, don't eat and watch TV, be on your phone, be on a computer, or do anything else. I've heard you talk about this. Explain it. Oh, studies are great on this. When we eat while distracted, we eat 10 to 15% more calories. And That's everybody's it. everybody's eating and watching TV right nowadays, now, looking at their phone, whatever. Nowadays, everybody's distracted, right? If, if you just did that, you can count on your calories dropping enough to see weight loss. So literally, when you eat, sit down, nothing else around me and just eat. So question on that, just to like clarify. So, you know, people eat with other people. Is that a form of distraction? Like, hey, you and I are enjoying lunch together and we're having a conversation while we're eating. Is that a distraction? Yeah. Um, okay. So I don't put that in the same category because um, the health benefits- You're not like completely tuning out. You're still Correct. in it. You're present. You're not like checked out watching this thriller or whatever. 100%. Um, you're still aware- but also, we do not want. I never want to negate the ben the health benefits of connecting with other sure. people. I mean, tremendous health benefits uh, with doing that. So yeah, you sit down and you eat with someone. By the way, you ever watch people eat together nowadays? They don't eat together. They eat at the same time, but they're on their phones or doing what I said earlier. But if you're just like doing what we're doing right now and we're eating, far less likely to overeat. Plus, we get to connect and sure. we have yeah, we have a good time. So which is another nutrient. A hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, that's kind of it right there. You know, focus on uh, <laughs> chewing your food really well. Sounds so stupid, but studies will show that'll drop your calories ten percent. Like these are these are behave these are ways to alter your behavior. Your behavior is what drives what you do. You don't alter your behavior by telling yourself to do these things. And then you're fighting these natural behaviors. It's like okay, I got to cut my calories by. 600, but I'm going to eat heavily processed foods. Whoa, well, that's going to be a struggle. What if I cut those foods out, ate as much as I wanted? What happens? I eat 600 less calories a day. So this is the way I would communicate it. Um, it's uh, like going uphill versus downhill. Totally. Are you pushing uphill and you're pushing a boulder versus, you know, are you going downhill with the natural momentum and the way that your behaviors are going still takes some behavioral change. But again, it goes back to the beginning of the conversation this is going to be much more sustainable and you're more likely to hit that initial goal faster in the first place as well. Absolutely. You're also going to do this over time. You start to change, you start to develop a new relationship with food. I can't stress this enough. I can't stress this enough. If you truly enjoy eating healthy, are you ever going to struggle with it? You know, people who aren't in the space that we're in, like we love it. We love what we do. That's why we do this, right? They don't relate to us when we say things like, oh, I love eating healthy. Oh, it's so great. Like, I love eating. Like, they look at us like, what are you talking about? Like, that salad and that bowl of vegetables and whatever, that's not as good as a pizza. Like, what are you talking about? Like, first off, you and I know how tasty a pizza is. I'm not an idiot. Yeah. Okay. But that's not, that's not all the enjoyment that I get from food. 
I've developed a relationship with food now where I can enjoy pizza sometimes, but most of the time I enjoy the other things I've become aware of around food. And that makes me want to eat those foods more. That makes me want to eat those foods even more than the slice of pizza, for example, because I know what comes along with that pizza and I'm aware of it. Oh, my digestion is going to be off. I'm going to be sluggish. I'm not going to feel as sharp. Is it worth it? Eh, occasionally it's worth it because I'm with my friends and we're hanging out, but most of the time it's kind of not. So you become more aware over time and you start to develop this relationship where you're like, wow, I really, you know, I kind of crave, you know, this, this healthy thing and I enjoy eating it. And then someone offers you a cookie and you say, yeah, I kind of don't want that cookie. Like how great would that be? Yeah. Ah, I kind of don't want that. Again, it doesn't mean you all of a sudden find the cookie to taste gross. You know, it tastes good. You just don't want it like you did before because you have a broader, wider understanding of all of the values of food. And this 100% can happen for people who are watching this right now, who uh, are saying that sounds crazy. Look, um, food companies, uh, food manufacturers know this. This is why marketing exists. Beer commercials. They never show somebody with a hangover. It's always at the beach and you're having a great time and you got the girls in the car and it looks great, right? They create these relationships for you because that goes into your decision-making process. Um, there is a learning process that goes along with this. And most of us, when it comes to food in particular, are in the first stage, which is we're just unconsciously incompetent. We just don't know what we don't know. Now, you're watching this and you're listening, and let's say you start applying some of the stuff, well, you're going to move into the second stage, which can be intimidating at first, which is you become consciously incompetent. This is where people sometimes get overwhelmed. Like, oh my gosh, all this stuff I don't know. Like, you're now aware of what you don't know. But stay the course. Give yourself, start with what is realistic for you, because it does build off of that. Don't go beyond what's realistic. That's a big mistake. And then you move to the third phase, which is conscious competence. That just means you have to think about what you're doing. You have to think about what you put in your mouth and, oh yeah, how does that make me feel? And, oh yeah, I should eat this. And, you know, I noticed my performance drop in the gym and these are the foods that make me feel better with performance. And this makes me not sleep as good. So I think I'm not going to eat this tonight. But then when you do that over time, you move into the final stage, which is uh, where you, where you want to be, which you can get to, which is you become unconsciously competent, which is... Mm -hmm how you live, how you eat. Um, and people ask you, how do you do it? And it seems so easy. And it's, it's so possible. It's so, I want people to know that right now. It is so possible. You do not have to become a fitness fanatic to get there. It's a place everybody can get. It's just, we've never, we've never practiced it. We don't know how to practice it. My space communicates it terribly. You know, the fitness space, the health space communicates it terribly. Um, they're trying to promise you the quick fix. They're trying to prey on your insecurities. They're telling you, take this pill or, or follow this crazy diet or do this thing and in 30 days and all that stuff. And um, no, no, no. It's possible. It takes a little bit of time. But if you do it the way that I'm explaining it, uh, you'll get there. And then it's going to be the point where it's just the way you live. You've had, you know, different zigs and zags in your journey because you've been in this space for a while. You know, you got into the whole fitness world because... You felt like you were a skinny kid yep. and you wanted to put on weight and muscle and other things and you had other, other zigs and zags. But when did it fundamentally change for you to have this positive relationship with food, which mm. also related to this positive relationship with yourself that you didn't hate yourself? Not that you were perfect all the time. Yeah. We all have moments, but that you weren't leading primarily because you had a negative view of yourself, but that you were going downhill, you were moving forward. You had momentum in your life because you loved yourself. You had a positive relationship. Yeah. When did uh, things change? Yeah. So I, I, I want to first, uh, communicate this so I don't come across, um, like I'm, uh, preaching from some, some high place. This is the human condition. Okay. So uh, I still, everybody will struggle forever. This is always going to happen. This is always something you're going to work on. It's, it's a journey. There, there is no destination to get to. And then you, and then you're done. Um, you know yourself better than anybody, which means you know all your imperfections um, and the negative attributes that you have and what you could have done better. So this is always going to be something that you're going to have to visit and work on. So I want to be very clear with that. And I still do. Okay. But it definitely gets better over time. You become more aware over time. And um, two things for me, first off, thankfully, 
I feel very blessed that I always really cared truly about the clients that I, I trained. And, and now why, why am I saying that? That drove me to be a great trainer for them way before I was a great trainer for myself. Cause it, it was so much easier to care about these people than it was to really view myself in that way. But through that process, it became really hard not to be like, why don't I apply that to myself? And I'm saying this to them, but why do I feel this way about myself? But I really, really cared about my clients. So that always drove me. I always wanted to do better. I always want to find ways to figure out ways to get this to become something they do forever and develop this relationship with it. And, and, and to the point where they didn't do this up and down and they felt good about it and they continued to enjoy this journey and stay on it for the rest of their life. So that really helped me. Um, but I had my own health scare or my own, um, you know, there was a, there was a period there where I, I had to face the music and it was, I was forced to look at myself and say, what the heck am I doing, uh, to myself? This was in my early thirties. So remember I'd, I'd been personally, uh, you know, working out and all that stuff since I was 14. And, and you, you, you said it earlier, it all started from being very insecure about my body. I think a lot of people start exercising from that standpoint. I was a very skinny kid and uh, felt inadequate, wanted to build muscle. And so um, I pursued it from that standpoint, which led me to do a lot of unhealthy things to my body, overtrain, you know, take supplements in ways that weren't healthy, even at, uh, at one point use designer steroids, which, uh, you know, uh, there was a period there where you can get them over the counter. And I did all that, um, uh, all these things that were not healthy in the pursuit of, you know, kind of trying to solve this insecurity, which Anybody who knows who's ever dealt with an insecurity knows that there's no, there's no solving it. It's like a bottomless pit, right? But I did these things for myself. Meanwhile, I'm caring about my clients, learning these things and becoming a great trainer. Well, anyway, in my early thirties, um, my body rebelled in a very big way. I developed digestive issues that, um, I couldn't figure out, lost a lot of weight, uh, lost something like 13 pounds of lean body mass. I felt terrible. All the healthy things that I thought were healthy were no, were no longer working for me. Losing strength in the gym. That's hitting my ego, right? I, I developed this shell of muscle um, because of this insecurity. And um, went to the doctor and they couldn't figure out what was going on. They were going to test me for Crohn's disease. Scary, really scary time because I had developed this kind of persona and this business around it. Like, who am I if my health goes south? Um, thankfully, I, I was surrounded by really, really good health practitioners. At the time I had a wellness studio and in my wellness studio, you know, we had trainers like myself, but then I had, um, people who did hormone and gut testing. I had people who did mindfulness type exercise. I had physical therapists in there. So these were really, really smart people in their own spaces. And I had worked with them and appreciated them and valued what they did. Cause I could see the, the benefit they brought clients, especially when clients worked with all of us, I could see like these people are just thriving, working with these people. But, you know, for me, not for me, I'm just going to lift weights and eat a lot of protein, take supplements and that kind of stuff. Well, here I am withering away. I feel like, you know, absolute crap. And I, I sat down with them and I said, look, I'm desperate. Mm -hmm. like, I, I don't know what the hell's going on. I will do whatever you tell me. I will do whatever you tell me. I am done trying to figure this out myself and, um, you know, I'm scared. So what should I do? And I did some gut testing, food sensitivity testing. I drastically reduced the intensity and frequency of my workouts. I focused on sleep. I cut all these other foods out of my diet. I started looking at, uh, you know, my dysbiosis I had in my gut. So I started working on things to treat things like SIBO. I stopped weighing myself. I stopped looking in the mirror. Those were all very triggering mm. for me. Um, because I was just like, I just need to fix this. I just need to fix this. And I don't, I need my health without my health. Like it, it doesn't matter. And I did this for about a year. It was a slow process and my body did, uh, slowly and then eventually heal, um, through that, through that process. And there was this and I did a really good job of not paying attention to my reflection. This was a, it was a big trigger. Like if I looked in the mirror, I knew that I would, it would push me to do the things that I had done before. So I just completely avoided, um, looking at mirrors. Well, there was this moment where, um, I was at a friend's house 
and it was a pool party and we were all swimming and, and having a good time. And I went to use the restroom and there were like two mirrors uh, in the bathroom. So one would reflect off the other one. And I caught a glimpse of myself from an angle that I'm not used to. For so, so for a split second, I was able to objectively view my reflection. Split second. I don't know if you've ever done that where you see yeah. yourself and, okay. So you don't have that subjective filter, right? And I looked at myself object just for a split second. And then I had this crazy, like, I don't know, it was this really, really weird experience. And then I looked in the mirror and I realized I looked better than I'd looked before, ever mm. before. I thought, oh my God, this whole time I was chasing this ideal, this aesthetic ideal. And through the process of just trying to be healthy, I actually got a lot further than I ever did before. And um, yeah, that's when it dawned on me, like chasing health was gonna give me a great deal of aesthetics. Chasing aesthetics, I would eventually lose my health and then lose my aesthetics. Mm. Um, and so um, it really did change uh, how I communicate health and fitness. Um, and uh, actually it, it helped shape and form the voice that I have now on my show and how I communicate things. But that was my personal experience. And, um, you know, I'd be lying if I said it, it's not always a struggle. You're always, you know, life is always going to challenge you in ways where, you know, it's easy to, to hate yourself. You know, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I have a business. And, um, but I'm aware, much more aware than I ever was before on whether or not I'm doing things from a place of hate or care. And I can, I think I can at least stop myself uh, before it gets too bad and move in the right direction. Yeah. Catching it, noticing it early. We all have it. Totally. What about things that you do yourself or with clients that are now the bonus on top of the foundation, right? You've already covered yeah. some of the foundational things in this episode. We did a lot on the previous episode as well. You know, not eating excess calories, especially from ultra processed foods. It's going to be hard to peel back from how addictive that lifestyle is. And it's just going to cause us to eat more focusing on whole foods, prioritizing protein for the satiety, as well as for the muscle building component. And then your recommendations for resistance training at some cadence, depending on where you're starting mm -hmm. in, in, in how this is following. Are there things now for those that are listening? Cause we have people of all different sort of cohorts yeah. that are following along that are like, hey, look, I'm looking for now the optimization category. Are there classifications that you now uh, either have an approach or a recommendation on the rabbit hole that people can go under? So let's start with the first one. Let's talk about like therapeutics, mm. right? Are you a fan of peptides or any additional components that people could be looking at now? Again, when they have a foundation of these basic things with diet, lifestyle, rest and sleep, which is an important part of it too, and and recovery. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, peptides are, I, I just started really working with and learning about peptides over the last year. Um, and they're remarkable at what they can do for the body. We had an expert on our show, Dr. Seeds, who's one of the leading researchers and doctors that work with peptides. Um, and he really illuminated uh, to me on what some of their effects and benefits are. So, now there's a lot of peptides that are out there, um, but some of them have some pretty remarkable pro health effects and they're different than drugs. This was a big one for me when I asked him this is, oh, what's the difference between a peptide and a pharmaceutical? So, well, peptides already exist in the body. So what we're doing is we're, we're using something the body's familiar with already has control mechanisms and barriers so that it doesn't overdo things. It doesn't downregulate receptors or cause other side effects. We know what the peptide, they're already in your body. So when we give you this peptide, um, it's a signal your body's used to. And that's why we don't see lots of these negative effects like we would with pharmaceuticals. So I thought that was interesting. The, the follow-up question was, well, why aren't, it wasn't every pharmaceutical company selling peptides? Well, the answer to that is their compound pharmacies can create them. You can't patent them. So you see right now these uh, GLP-1 agonists like... Um, semaglutide or what's the Ozempic is the brand name, right? That's making lots of waves right now. Yeah. Right. Um, you could buy semaglutide from a compounding pharmacy and you're not getting Ozempic, the brand name, but it's the same thing. In fact, they're 
they're lobbying the FDA, of course, to to stop this because I think they want to protect their profits. But it is an interesting space. But you're right. Uh, uh, in comparison to other lifestyle changes, they're, they pale in comparison. But peptides can be pretty interesting, especially as you get older. And if you've done all the other stuff and you want to kind of like take it to the next level. I've now experienced uh, certain peptides and some of them are pretty remarkable. Uh, BPC-157, um, thymus and beta-4. Um, I'm noticing some very interesting effects from those in terms of inflammation and recovery. Um, so, you know, but I, those aren't things that I would, you know, recommend to clients before having them work on their, their diet or exercise. Um, here's something that's, you know, it's common. I find, you know, once I say this compound, you'll know it because everybody knows it, but it's quite clear that this is a pro longevity, pro health, pro wellness supplement, which is creatine. Creatine has you know, that was originally sold for people who want to build muscle or improve their strength and performance. Creatine is healthy. It's healthy across the board. It's good for everybody. It uh, It's very good for mitochondrial health. It's very good for the heart. It's good for the brain. Um, most people should be taking creatine because it's got health benefits uh, across the board. And in fact, the wellness space is starting to now promote it. But I, I think in the next 10 years, it's going to be we're going to give it to everybody because it seems to have health benefits across the board. It's also the most studied supplement. There's literally thousands of studies on creatine. It's a very safe uh, compound as well. So that's that's something that I like to. Do you know enough with. about creatine to kind of explain to the audience kind of how it works and why it's beneficial? Yeah. So creatine in, in increases or helps fuel the amount of ATP that your body uses, which is a fundamental, you know, muscle energy, or, or should I say, fundamental form of energy for all mitochondria. So more ATP means the mitochondria um, operates uh, more effectively and efficiently. We just talked about mitochondria earlier, about its role, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction in cancer. They see mitochondrial dysfunction in all and almost all chronic kind of health issues. So it's keeping the mitochondria healthy. It also um, reduces the amount of methyl donors you need for all, lots of complicated processes in the body. So you'll hear that sometimes like, oh, you need more methyl donors. You should supplement with methyl B vitamins, or if you have this particular gene variant or whatever, creatine is very effective at that. But if you look at the data, look at the data on creatine and cognitive function, depression, heart function, liver function, you know, uh, you know, um, just, uh, just the, the entire body it seems to have this pot, bone, bone health, of course, muscle health across the board. And again, it's got a lot of studies. I mean, you could it's literally... I think thousands, if I'm not if I'm not uh, mistaken, of studies have been done on creatine. So, good stuff. Any other supplements that you are a fan of in terms of um, now kind of moving from foundational to bonus and optimization? Yeah. Of course, you can go, and we've done so many episodes about the benefits of all sorts of different, there's an endless list of supplements that are there, uh, omegas and this and that, but specifically in the context of um, building lean muscle mass, dialing in body composition. Yeah. Um, nothing is going to beat filling a nutrient deficiency. Okay. So if you get a nutrient test and you're not in optimal range for vitamin D, which is quite common, uh, a lot of people are deficient in vitamin D or magnesium. It's another common one. Zinc. Uh, that's a common one. And you supplement or B, B vitamins, especially if you're a vegan, and you fill that nutrient gap, it'll have profound effects on your health. Not because those nutrients are magic, but rather you are operating below, um, you know, how your body's supposed to operate because you were deficient in this thing. So like vitamin D deficiency, depression, anxiety, low testosterone, skin, bone, hair issues. Um, so you all of a sudden fill that nutrient gap and it's like, oh my God, I feel so much better. So nothing's going to beat that. The second thing would be creatine. The third thing, just because of its utility as a protein uh, supplement because you know what I said earlier for if, if you try this look if you listen to what I said and you're like okay I'm gonna hit my target body weight in protein you're gonna find pretty quickly it's hard it's not easy uh, it produces a lot of satiety um, you know really really you know whole foods that contain protein um, just just fill you up it's it's tough to hit those numbers so a protein powder can be beneficial and I like to use it to fill the gap so you hit the end of the day you look at your protein intake I'm 30 grams off, take a 30 gram protein shake and that'll, that'll give you some, pro some pretty profound benefits. I don't think you should depend on a protein shake though. I think it's, 
like I said, use it as a, uh oh, I didn't hit my targets. Now I'm going to take the shake to, to fill those needs. And that's pretty much it. Other supplements, you know, in special populations will have benefits. You know, ashwagandha seems to have some benefits for stress management as an adaptogen, but there's some cases where it might not be a good idea. Rhodiola, you know, is another one that might have some benefits. Um, but uh, they're, you know, we're, we're talking about like 1% effect when you're, when you're comparing it to, you know, diet, exercise, sleep, and lifestyle. Any modalities that you're a big fan of when it comes to recovery besides, of course, making sure that people are eating appropriate amount of protein, I yeah. often find. And that was one of the things that I noticed. I used to always feel that, oh, when I go to the gym and I like lift hard, I feel like a really sore. Yeah. And then I work with a great training group out here. I think I mentioned to you last time uh, for almost a year. It's called Ultimate Performance. Mm. They're out of uh, the UK. And uh, just by consistently making sure that I hit my protein goals every day, I was immediately less sore, even though I was oh, yeah. much older than when I was, you know, first sort of dabbling a little bit here and there in doing some tiny bit of strength training, even though I was never, you know, consistent about it. So yeah. anything that you're a big fan of on the recovery side? Uh, well, nothing's going to be good sleep. Now, a lot of people, when I say that, like, oh, I get good sleep. Here's something that everybody, most people do that they don't realize um, is compromising their sleep quality and actually having a pretty big effect on their recovery and also their health. Okay. So I'll paint the picture. Everybody does this, right? They go to bed at the same time, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday comes along. Well, I don't have to wake up early on Saturday. So I'm going to go to bed two or three hours later. Saturday comes along. Well, I don't need to work Sunday. I got to wake up late. I'm going to sleep in. So I'm going to go to bed two or three hours later than I normally do. Monday comes along. Guess what happens? Jet lag. You literally give yourself jet lag every single week. Look at the studies on the, the detrimental effects of jet lag. And we give ourselves, we literally change our circadian rhythm once a week, every single week. This is why people hate Mondays. Waking up Mondays like, oh, it's so painful. <laughs> it's because you gave yourself jet lag. You can't make up for that by sleeping in, by the way. There's a little bit of benefit to it, but you can't talk to any sleep expert. So just do this. Go to bed and wake up the same time every single day. That will have profound benefits for stra for recovery. Profound. So sleep is up at the top. And there's other things you can do for sleep that I'm sure you've had people on your show talk about. But that one right there, I tell people that and it blows their minds. So like, oh my God, I do that every weekend. I, I would love to bring up, uh, Tess, I just texted you um, um, an article that I came across recently in uh, psychiatrist.com. If you could bring it up. This is... Uh, yep, there it is. Did you see this? No. Okay, no. so title this paper... Uh, so it's titled an article, and then we'll click into the paper in a second. Why sleep consistency may be more important than duration. So if you scroll down, it says new paper. Let's go ahead and click on that. According to a new paper. So this was the mind-blowing part that was there. So the title of the paper is sleep regularity is a stronger predictor of mortality risk than sleep duration, a prospective cohort study. So this was done in the UK by a group of individuals that I believe are affiliated with Oxford. And in this subset, they took almost 67,000 people that they had attached watch accelerometers to as part of this study. And they looked at one week of data about sleep consistency. And they found that people who had the best sleep consistency and sleep regularity, which was defined as going to sleep around the same time within, an, within like an hour mm -hmm. every night. And then waking up around the same time. And they had a sleep midpoint, which honestly, I didn't fully understand how they calculated that or what the benefit was, but essentially was going to sleep regularly and waking up at the same time. Those individuals had an all-cause all mortality risk uh, decrease. We'll put it on our YouTube page and we'll link to it at the bottom because we're writing an article mm -hmm. on it. But it was something crazy. You had like a 68% decrease in all cause mortality, <laughs> you had a decrease in cancer you had a, and this was predictive. So even though it was only one week of looking at this data from this accelerometer, yeah. quite a decent sized group of people, 67,000 people, it was predictive of who later ended up developing and dying early yeah. and who developed cancer and these other things. So not to say that sleep duration isn't important. And that's what the researchers are saying is just that sleep consistency going back to circadian rhythms and all these other aspects is so crucial if we want to get all the benefits of sleep. Yeah, it's uh, it's in, when I bring this up, people always trip out over it. But look at the data on swing shift workers. Have you seen that? I mean, the cancer risk, the heart disease risk. I mean, all chronic 
disease risk with when with controls goes through the roof with people who don't go to bed when the sun goes down and don't wake up when the sun goes up. We evolved this way. There, okay, humans did not evolve unless there was an emergency or famine or something crazy. When it got dark, we're not very good at seeing in the dark. Okay, we're actually food. When you go out, if you go out in nature in the wilderness and it's, it's the sun is down, you are food. So we went into our caves or went to our and we went to sleep. We, that's what we did. And we woke up when the sun went up. What we do in modern societies, because we can artificially create light and whatever, and we distract ourselves and have entertainment, it's just, we literally throw our circadian rhythms off every single week. So think about this. If you're listening right now, think about how terrible it feels Monday morning when you got to wake up at 6 a.m. after sleeping in Saturday and Sunday because you went to bed so late. It feels terrible. It probably takes you until Tuesday or Wednesday to adjust. And then you repeat the cycle again. So literally, it's just, it's just such a simple hack. Go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, no matter what. Now, of course, there's going to be exceptions and stuff like that. But if you do this for the most part, you'll notice a profound impact on your recovery, on your strength, on your performance, just by doing that simple thing right there. You're literally jet lagging yourself every week. What's your take on alcohol consumption? Yeah. You know, when it comes to substances like alcohol, there's a trade-off. And the trade-off is this, because you can also get too fanatical with the, is it good for me? Is this perfect? Right? There's also life quality, quality of life. So if I'm meeting up with you and we're good friends, we haven't seen each other for a while. We're both health conscious people. We sit down, we're like, let's have, let's have some wine and hang out. There's some health benefits to that wine. Now, it's not physiological benefits. Now, I know some people make arguments about the resveratrol or antioxidant, whatever. A glass of, of, of grape juice would do the same thing, I guess. It's, it, that's, there's, the, physiologically, there's really no benefits. Alcohol's not really good for you, okay? But you and I bonding, connecting, catching up, having a great time, that's got benefits, right? So there's a bit of a trade-off, I think. And I think that's true for lots of things that we do that we wouldn't necessarily put in the category of, you know, healthy, right? Like going on vacation, not working out, indulging in, you know, the, the, the foods of the culture that were around and, you know, drinking some alcohol with my wife and having a great time. Like, yeah, I'm not working out, I'm not eating perfect, but is that good for me? Of course it is. Of course it is. So there's a life quality aspect as well. Um, there's a term called orthorexia, which describes the extreme case of, of being unhealthy because you're too healthy. Follow orthorexics. These are people who stress out over every morsel that they put in their mouth. Everything that they do has to be perfect and structured and aligned because it has to be perfectly healthy. And they don't, they're not very healthy if you look at them. They have high rates of anxiety and depression and medication and their mortality isn't super great as well. Um, you know, there was a study that was, that I, you know, I often quote that showed that having poor relationships was as bad for your health as smoking 10 cigarettes a day. I think it was. So there's a balance there. So, you know, if you're drinking at home by yourself, you know, to numb yourself, probably not a good idea, but if you have the occasional glass of wine or bottle of wine with your friends, because you're bonding and having a great time, it's probably okay. Yeah. There's this whole movement now of like people kind of seeking out natural wines I don't know if you've, you know, when you've gone back to Italy yeah. to visit or Sicily, which by the way, Sicily is one of my favorite places. Oh, good. You've been there. I've been to uh, a few spots. Um, uh, or Ortigia, Ortigia. Okay. I've um, never been there. Been to Taramina? Uh, Taramina. Yeah, yep. beautiful. Yeah. I was there just uh, for a wedding uh, uh, earlier this year. Gorgeous. Um, beautiful place. If you've ever gone to like Europe or Italy and you've had like traditional sort of like table wines, yeah. right? There's a few things you notice. Number one. They have like less alcohol. That's the first thing. A lot of the wines we've had here, especially the ones that have become more globalized, and you look at the wine industry, it's been sort of manufactured to be higher alcohol wines, mm -hmm. you know, 14, 15, 16, 17, 19% sometimes wines yeah. that people are picking up in terms of alcohol percentage because they've had to keep up with all the other hard liquors and other things and make inroads into the market. The other thing is that I learned from uh, my friends, no affiliation with them, but uh, they started a company called Dry Farm Wines. Have okay. you seen these guys? I haven't. They're up in the Bay Area and they test uh, wines to make sure that they're like mold free because mold is a big issue mm -hmm. in barrels. But in the US alone, there's like hundreds of additives that you can put in yeah. to wine without disclosing it on the label. 
Like you can make it taste sweeter. You can put in added sulfates. You can do this. You can do that. You can, it's like almost as processed as ultra processed foods. So this whole natural wine movement, I think is really good for people going back to probably if wines are a healthier part and people can enjoy them in a way, it's probably going to be more how like we consume them in the past with people and environment and, and and not at home by yourself. Yeah. Now you're talking. See, I think, look, I, I've talked, I just did a whole spiel about hyper palatable foods and palatability and whatever, but there's a big difference between, you know, me visiting my aunt who I haven't seen in a while, who makes this incredible dish, a Sicilian dish called pasta, pasta al forno. Okay. Now it's not healthy. Okay. But When I go there and she prepares it, she takes her time to cook it. And maybe I go there early and I help her out. And then we sit down and enjoy the meal together. That's very different than me grabbing a box of cookies or Doritos or Cheez-Its, okay? Even if the macros are controlled, there's a value there that's a little bit different. So I think when you look at your food and you, uh, you respect it, and it's like, I'm not drinking this to get drunk. I'm drinking this to enjoy it and enjoy our company. Very different. I'm not eating this to just numb myself. And, you know, um, one of the behaviors that you'll that you'll notice, maybe even in yourself, when you eat things in an unhealthy way, okay, is you're not enjoying the the bite that's in your mouth. You're thinking about the one that's mm. on the fork or the, the 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 piece that's in your hand. You ever do that? You eat something and you just it's like you, you can't even enjoy this one. You just want to get the next one. Yeah, like potato chips. Yes. <laughs> versus you and I go to dinner and somebody just makes an incredibly enjoyable meal and we're enjoying it. We're savoring it. Right. So, you know, I've had alcohol, like when I was a kid, you know, when we make stupid th- decisions, not that I don't make them now, but a lot more when I was younger, where we go and the goal is to get drunk. I'm not enjoying this drink. It's like, we're just going to get drunk because I don't know, maybe I'm anxious and it's social lubricant. Who knows? Right. But versus now, if you and I go and we enjoy, I'm, I'm going to enjoy and savor what's in this glass and I'm going to enjoy the conversation. So I think that falls in line with that. Like, I don't think palatable foods are necessarily a bad thing when you respect them, you prepare them and you enjoy the company that you're with if it brings people together. So now we're talking about the balance around these types of things. And I think you can bring that all the way back to something that I said earlier. Okay. If you feed yourself, if you exercise yourself, if your behaviors, if the things that you do center around self-care, then you're probably going to make a lot of balanced decisions. So if, if, if I go, if you ask me, you invite me to go out to have some pizza and some beer and I'm in the mode of self-care, I can make a very balanced decision. I can say, Ooh, my health hasn't been so good lately. I think I'm going to skip on that, but I'll come hang out with you. Or yeah, you know what? I've been eating pretty good. I'm pretty healthy. I feel good. I'm going to enjoy some beer and some pizza with you. So I think the decisions you make when they come from that place, what you'll find is you'll, you'll, you'll start to more naturally find a place of balance. And I think that's the root of the sustainability of a healthy lifestyle. If you don't have that, it's either going to be obsession, body obsession, some kind of dysmorphia or some kind of orthorexia is really what's going to keep you consistent. And that's not healthy either. One of the things I really appreciate about your message is that you are the first person to admit that the fitness space and the health and wellness space hasn't done the best job. Mm. And in some cases done a bad job of communicating a lot of the basics that are there. And you're trying to right those wrongs, you and your team. And I think you've been doing a great job about that. And that we all have to be protective of the over-marketing, over-exaggerations, extreme polarizing views of people wanting us to demonize certain macronutrients, uh, certain, you know, food things saying that, you know, completely stay away from processed foods. And I think that's an important message because really this is about the foundational things that we do, you know, 80 to 90% of the time. And then there's that aspect that's going to be our own life and the contextualization where truly, if it is actually 10, 5% of your life, then great, go ham and have fun and do the Mm -hmm. things that you want to do. Another area, and the reason I enjoy following you on Twitter is that you are, or X now, is that you're also very vocal about being, people being protective of their minds of this onslaught of kind of 
for lack of a better term, mainstream media trying to yeah. demonize the approach of health and fitness. Yeah. You made a hint to this previously, but you were talking about, you know, you can Google some of the articles that are out there, but you know, oh, fitness and getting fit has its roots in ultra right nationalist or white nationalist. Oh, God, Another one so that much. was there recently, Tessa, maybe if you can Google this, this is an article that was written and it was um, uh, ultra right and seed oils, right? That yeah. anybody who wants to not overconsume or wants to stay away, there was a Rolling Stone article. Yeah. It was called, Why is the Right So Obsessed with Seed Oils? It's yeah. by EJ Dixon. Uh, and first of all, it's funny that that's being placed on you know the right. I have friends of all different political uh -huh. spectrums who actually have, which is what you're advocating for, a truly balanced and nuanced approach, which is that, great, do we want to be over-consuming seed oils? And typically what has a lot of seed oils? It's ultra-processed foods. Yeah, thank you, yes. Right? And it's okay to want to avoid that. And at the same time too, seed oils and having it once is not going to kill you you know, overnight. And it has, doesn't have to be this thing that plays into orthorexia. So I'm bringing all these things up because I want to give you an opportunity to sort of talk about why do you feel like it's important for you as uh, an, you know, an authority in this space to want to speak up about some of these coordinated attempts of people trying to demonize healthy approaches to living? Um, I think it's safe to say, and I think most people agree that Everything these days has become politicized. And I didn't I never thought that they would come for health and fitness. I, it didn't make any sense. Why how it is how is health and fitness political? And yet here they here they are somehow politicizing or demonizing something that there isn't a person on the in this world who whose life would not improve if their health improved. Everybody's life would improve. I don't care what you believe in. If you got healthier more mobile, more functional, your life would improve. Also, I said this earlier, gyms are the most, people like to talk about inclusivity and non-judgmental places. Go to a gym. There is no place on earth more accepting. You go in there as an obese, out of shape, unhealthy person, go try to exercise. The most support you'll get will be from the fanatics in that space. So it, it I, I take it very, very personal when they try to attack fitness because not only is it wrong, it's the opposite. Of right. All right. So let me paint the picture real quick so people can understand why this is happening. Okay. I don't think it's a political party necessarily that's going after one side or the other. Some people can make that argument, but here's what it is. When people are unhealthy, they're very profitable. Go to the grocery store, take all of the foods and products that we could label as not healthy and take all the foods and products that are labeled as healthy, line them up which one makes up a bulk of the grocery store, okay? Your consumption habits when you're unhealthy are very different than when you're healthy. It's easy to sell you a lot of products that are processed and patented when your consumption habits are based off of an un unhealthy lifestyle versus healthy. What about medical costs, pharmaceuticals? Do pharmaceutical companies profit from your being healthy or, from pro or profit from you being unhealthy? Look at your consumption habits with technology. When, by the way, when I say healthy, I mean healthy. I don't just mean fit because there's fit unhealthy people too. I mean healthy, like emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, you're a balanced, healthy person. What are your social media consumption habits? What are your technology consumption habits? What are your consumption habits just in general? Do healthy people have uh, shopping habits that are unhealthy? Not as much as people are unhealthy who, who may buy things to fill holes or gaps in the way they feel. Um, look at your consumption habits with entertainment. I mentioned pharmaceuticals. It's in lots of markets, best interests to prevent you from becoming healthier and more fit. It's lots of markets, self-interest to take away the self-empowerment you get from being fit and healthy. When I'm sick now, if I were to get ill tomorrow, I am more vulnerable to manipulation. I, I am not, I don't feel as strong. I don't feel as confident, okay? You take someone that's chronically unhealthy and you're manipulatable. You're very manipulatable. It's very easy for me to scare you 
into voting or buying in the way that I want. So when you see stuff like this, realize that they don't want a healthy population. They want an unhealthy population. And that's just a fact. And I don't care what market you take any market, the makeup market, the moisturizer market, the clothing market, the car market, electronics, social media, medicine, supplements, food. There's more money to make off of you when you are an unhealthy person. And again, in that entirety than when you're healthy, that's, that's, that's just a fact. So, and, and, and that's a sad fact, but that's what we're up against. And I say we, and I, I mean that as those of us who truly understand what we're up against and who are trying to really help people. You know, I didn't become a trainer to make a lot of money. By the way, that's a terrible way to make a lot of money. <laughs> One thing I love about trainers and uh, fitness coaches is that they don't do it because they're looking for honor or glory or money. It's a terrible way to do all of those things. Maybe, maybe a little bit easier now with social media, but you talk to any trainer and you ask them why they became a trainer. It's like, they, I just want to help people. I really want to help people. I, lo I love what I do. I want to help people out. Um, and that's what I did for years. I just stumbled upon this social media thing, starting a podcast that became very successful. But the reason, the, the whole goal behind it wasn't even to make a ton of money. It was like, can we reach more people with this message? We don't like the direction of the fitness industry. We were sick and tired. And I say we, cause I have co-hosts that were also trainers. We were sick and tired of having to constantly battle this with our clients. Like, can we put this message out and reach more people? So that's when you see stuff like that, like fitness is fat shaming. That's another one. That's crazy. Fat shaming. That's terrible. Now, yeah, sir, sure, some people will shame themselves into fitness, but one message you'll hear me communicate time and time again is don't work out because you hate yourself. It's a terrible way to achieve any kind of success. Do it because you care about yourself. Fitness is self-care. So I take it very personal when I see these crazy messages. By the way, people's voting habits do, and we have strong evidence to suggest that they do tend to change when people become more fit and healthy. So that may be also be why you see some of this stuff, so. Hey YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. The presumption, unfortunately, for most people probably listening today, is the process of disease is expected to accumulate as you age. And that's not the case.